I think we're just waiting for a few more folks, obviously, to come in yeah. the room. There we go. Hello. Hello. Is it just us three? I don't know. No, there must be more because we also need our uh, or or Suzanne, are you our are you our note taker? <laughs> no. Uh, Moana. Yeah. Moana. Hey, Gary. Hi, Adele. Hi. Hi. Hey, one thing they did not tell us was how many folks would be coming into each room. Um, it looks like we saw a few more, okay. Hi, Morris. Hi, hey, Morris, good to see you again. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Probably five because five times six or 30, and I think that we have six groups. Yep. All right. Um, so I'm just gonna take notes. Um, and one of you all, if one of you all would be willing to kind of represent the group and when we meet back with the larger group to present notes, um, if you'd like for me to share the notes with you at that time, I can do that. Um, and otherwise, I'm just kind of here to answer technical questions and, and take notes or, you know, questions that are district specific if that, if something needs clarification, but mostly I'm just going to let you guys um, chat. Do you need to, a reminder of the questions? Yeah. Sure. What was the first one? So the first question is, what assumptions do you think are important for the district to consider in developing new trails? And I think we have about 10 to 15 minutes to discuss that before moving into the second question, which is, what ideas do you have for promoting conservation goals and minimizing impacts of trail use? So again, that first one is, what assumptions do you think are important for the district to consider in developing new trails? So, I mean, can our answer to that be <laughs> environment and experience? <laughs> I don't know what, what do you mean by, I'm, I'm not clear on what they mean by assumptions. I'm thinking, is it like that? Uh, that they Maybe it means priorities? Them? Yeah. Okay. Would it be, um, for example, I think we've had a lot of discussion about safety in different user groups. So considering like the safety as a factor for when we determine if the trail should be multi-use because not all trails would be safe or have the factors to be multi-use. So, you know, if it permits, so safety as a factor when considering, is that kind of what you mean, Suzanne? like thinking of those type of factors? Um, actually, the, these questions were actually proposed by today's um, presenters. So Mimi is here, so she could clarify that okay. for you. But I think it's also, you know, how you all interpret it. You know, when we are developing new trails, um, my read on it was that it was talking about, you know, the trail itself, the experience, the user group, its impact. So we're kind of looking at it from multiple angles. Mimi, do you have something you want to add or clarify? Sorry, I was late. They put me in another group and moved me in. <laughs> um, yeah, as far as the safety trails, um, we thought that had been pretty well uh, covered. Um, from the perspective of the environmentalists, safety conflicts occur when on narrow trails, not between horses and um, hikers, but between hikers mostly and fast bicycles. Uh, and they occur both because of the speed and because of the nature of a narrow trail. So from our perspective, it's very difficult to do a narrow trail with enough of uh, safety issues uh, from speeding bicycles. Now, Morris, I understand that all bicyclists speed uh, and we would get back to the complication between the enforcements, um, but 
it's very difficult for us to conceive a very well done <coughs> narrow trails that do allow for the sight lines and that sort of thing because you have breakout bulbs you're doing more destruction um, to the habitat if you have um, wider wider trails uh, neither the hikers nor the bikers are happy with the wider trails uh, so from that point of view the uh, an RPA's point of view doing narrow a lot of narrow trails that are multi-use is so difficult that we don't think very many should be done, particularly in the new properties. So I think the question. The let, 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 let me let me say um, repeat something that I included in an email. I think that two assumptions that the park district should move forward on are number one that in the new parks, there's going to be a lot of demand for trails um, and that that will take some of the demand away from the existing parks where people who live near the parks that aren't open are coming, flocking to the parks that already exist and increasing the traffic there. Um, overall, the uh, district should, should ensure that all trail user groups have opportunities for recreation. Um, so there should be adequate trails in the new parks for bicyclists, for equestrians, for uh, hikers, for dog walkers, for runners. Um, at the same time, in each individual instance of a new park or a new trail, there are individual considerations that need into account in terms of the habitat, in terms of uh, all other environmental considerations, in terms of the steepness of trails, the kinds of things that the park district has always looked at when building new trails or when uh, rehabilitating or rerouting old trails. Um, and uh, those two things to me are, are, are very, very key uh, priorities for, for, for the park district, especially keeping in mind that as the 2011 narrow trail study done by the East Bay Regional Park Districts, uh, Jim Townsend and Julie Bondurant observed, it's much harder to change the use of existing mm -hmm. trails. Um, it's much easier to set up new trails with multiple use. Um, and, you know, I was talking to people from John Muir Land Trust just yesterday about the fact that all of their trails are multi-use, almost all of them are narrow, they don't have any significant trail user conflict. Why is that? Is that because Why? they not use that much? Is, is that because they, uh, they don't, uh, they're a, a private agency and not a public agency? I think the main reason is, is because when they opened those trails, they opened them on that basis and people accepted that people can use the trails in varying ways, as did uh, the Marin Parks, when they opened up uh, the, uh, the new, oh, what was the name of that trail? The trail, but they just opened. Bill, uh, Bill's Trail? Much? Bill's, tra Bill's Trail? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, that's the state park. Uh, no. This was okay. a new trail, but they did a workshop out at the Trails Conference that they carefully considered, and they met with environmentalists for a year before they opened it. And the environmentalists there said, the, uh, in her presentation, the head of the Friends of Port of Madera Creek said that she's not that concerned about which trail user groups use that trail because it's known to everybody when they go out in Marin Parks which groups are using which trails. And they can choose the trails that they feel most comfortable on. What they made sure of in their meeting year of meetings with the Marin County Parks was that the environmental considerations were taken care of and that the new trail would not be destructive to habitat. Um, it's worth noting that they were replacing an old trail that was very destructive to habitat. Um, so, that, so that entered into it. Um, I'll, I'll stop and may have future. There's one ideas. issue about 
equity Morris and stuff like I because I I agree with a lot of what you've said but as far as we haven't discussed is just as far as the equity in the different trails so I hope if there were uh 10 trails that you were considering building and then there's different populations with less access to trails um and that you could increase the access to that community by building a trail in there versus the other parks that you'll kind of um take that into consideration just as far as how much trail access does the surrounding community have and how much access does different low income communities have to the trails. Um, so just, I hope that um, equity lens is kind of um, used to, to prioritize um, which trails are opening. Um, and then also looking at increased access um, just what areas are getting the most heavily impacted with new users um, who have um, through this pandemic decided that um, they enjoy trails too and have been introduced to the park. So what areas need relief? Um, and I think um, having more trails and then um, in these different areas um, would kind of um, provide some type of relief. Um, because some of the parks that people do go to are those familiar ones, the ones that are easily accessed, or the ones where they feel safe at. So Coyote Hills is a park where, you know, it's open, you can see, um, and, you know, that's a different way, you know, people feel safe. Um, so those are just like, I think, some considerations. I'd like to say that, yeah, I mean, Luann, I, I second everything you said and Morris also, and I, and both, what both of you said is like what I'm seeing in my idea of looking at the big map, the big picture of, you know, where's what, where are the populations, where's the demand, where is there, where do we need some relief? Exactly. Yeah, just a quick add on. In, in terms of the new parks, uh, a lot of them are in pretty far-flung areas. In some areas, there's stables right next door. And those parks, equestrian usage is going to be higher than parks where there's no stables next door. In fact, <clears throat> in parks that have no stables nearby, unless they build uh, <clears throat> staging areas with specific access for horse trailers, there will be no equestrian use at all. Uh, and the parks where there's no stables nearby maybe end up being more tilted towards mountain bikes, whereas the parks where stables are nearby end up being a little more tilted towards equestrian usage. Um, I can see that you know, both those things could come into play. And conflict can be, can be avoided if those, you know, when, to some extent when those things are taken into consideration. Is in this group, is there no um, uh, assumption that in particular areas of this enormous park district, there are serious conflicts happening now? You're asking whether people are aware of conflict? If you believe there are serious conflicts currently, if that's an assumption on which you work and therefore those conflicts need to be resolved. Yes, resolving conflict is, is what safety is all about. And I think safety and environment are our number one priorities. Um, so, so it's not a, it's a say, I mean, conflict isn't an assumption, it's a fact. So, um, so yes, there it, are conflicts. I mean, that's obviously there are conflicts because <laughs> just from all the presentations yeah, okay. today. Okay, so if, yeah. if everybody believes there are conflicts, does everybody agree on what has caused those conflicts? I, I think we all believe there's contributing factors to the conflicts, but I don't think um, just as far everyone might have the same number one, number two, number three, 
Um, I think as just as far as we need to, you know, look at all those different conflicts and weigh them. And some of those conflict conflicts, you know, are more towards one area, one park than another park. Um, so I, I don't think any of us want to diminish the conflict that people feel because, um, you know, like if you're in certain areas, yeah, it, it, it is real, you know, bikes at um, Crockett Hills are real, <laughs> um, you know, trailer parking, um, being parked at with other cars is real, you know, I was just at Crockett Hills myself. So we realize those things occur, but it's, I think it's really how do we work as a group so we can start to like, make it that, you know, these conflicts are lesser, that we educate the public, and that we build new trails in a way where, you know, we lessen that impact. And then also that as far as we acknowledge that, you know, needs are changing. Um, I think how some of us personally feel about trails, you know, myself um, is in that category too, you know, maybe very different how than how the demographics are changing. So like, how do we find a way where we can all co coexist on these trails? And I don't think any of us want people to go away in this group feeling like their voices weren't heard or we're not gonna consider their input. And then we're not gonna work in a way where each of us can feel safer in the future on the trails. I just thought of one other quick, quick point, which is that, um, you know, the, the incidents that I've had with mountain bikes have almost entirely been on fire roads where they can pick up speed and go really fast. On narrow trails, they cannot go as fast as they can on fire roads. It just, it just, doesn't, it just doesn't happen that way. It can be scarier because it's a narrower trail and people can react more. But in fact, the speed is more of an issue on fire roads. Um, the other thing is that in terms of overall uh, assumptions, conflict is real, but we have to remember that every park survey that's been done shows great satisfaction with the parks, a huge appreciation of the natural resources, the wildlife that is there. And the, the trail user conflict, which we're so focused on, does not enter into the minds of most people on a given day in the parks. They may have experienced it at some time, but it's not a constant presence uh, for most people. It's, it's, it's a, an occasional annoyance and, and, and an important one that, that should be dealt with and should be dealt with by you know, allow, uh, opening new, new parks that allow the concentration on existing parks to decrease and by opening more trails to mountain bikes, they don't have to feel like they all have to get onto a few trails that other people are using that they, you know, that they tend to concentrate their efforts on um, and, and thereby, you know, if, if they have places where they can go elsewhere, there'll be less of them on the trail that, that, that flower walkers and bird watchers want to be on. Morris, we where, on the second question, where do the concentration of mountain bikers come from? What area do you think? I think Are that, there more, you know, mountain it, bikes, Mountain bikes, mountain bikes today cost, you know, as much as a horse used to or more. And I think a lot of it comes from, uh, or is in Contra Costa more than say Oakland or Berkeley. There are mountain bikers in Oakland and Berkeley, but I think a lot more are coming in in the, subdiv the subdivisions out in the hills where people own their own homes and are not renting, have room for mountain bikes. Uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe there should be a demographic study on that. Maybe there already is. I haven't seen it. Well, I would say, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, there's also a lot of usage at Chabot is very popular with mountain bikers. Um, and then the, you know, generally I, I seem to notice that a lot of the adults are, um, <laughs> are the problem bikers. Um, the kids we're, we're teaching them in through the NorCal league. And I'm a, I'm one of the coaches there. We're, we're teaching them respect for all these things and not to ride illegal trails and so on. Um, but I think that's where it's important. And for, those kids, it's really important for them to have access to parks with trails that they can go on 
and they're not because they don't drive and they like to ride to the park. And so that's where Luana's comment about having, you know, about equity, you know, having things that are available to them to access is important. Um, I did want to also throw in one thing, you know, I, I consider myself a very, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm the pack representative, I'm not the mountain bike representative, but I consider myself an extremely courteous mountain biker, especially because I'm, you know, sensitive to all these issues. And I slow way, way, way down when I pass a hiker. And so the other day, I, and this has happened a number of times, wide fire road, plenty of space for everybody. There's a hiker, I come by, I slow way, way, way down, almost to a stop because they had dogs with them. And they let a dog come right in front of me and then proceeded to yell at me for going too fast when I had basically slowed down to practically a stop. And then another day I was on my mountain bike and I came out and there, I was approaching someone from behind and I called out, I said, I'm coming by on your left and I slowed way down and she said, thank you. And then as I passed, proceeded to berate me for like all the, all the bad behavior by any mountain biker. And, you know, so it's mountain bikers experience conflict coming from hikers that we pass, even though we're doing everything we can. Um, to be Adele, Adele, there's yahoos in every room. yeah so that was my point and that was my point uh, so i think if, we need to there look were at to be um, a big push for more mountain bike available uh trails particularly yes. in east county to to diverse it yeah. is there an assumption that those trails would uh, be in addition to everything that mountain bikes are allowed on now or that there could be a balance there's new trails and therefore a couple of trails that are experiencing most conflicts between people could be closed to bicycles which assumption is there i think the trails that are that experience the most conflict or the most safety issues that are reported anyway are trails where mountain bikers are not usually allowed. And so that's an enforcement issue. And restricting them off those trails is not gonna change anything because they're already restricted from those trails. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, the only thing that can, that can keep, get, get, that can ease the conflict on those trails is, is if they have some other place that they can go safely um, without having to poach trails that where they're not allowed. And if we look I just I'm going to jump in here real, real quick and just I, I like the discussion so if you guys want to keep rolling with it I mean this is your group to do that with but I do want to remind you that we do have a second question and we have about 10 minutes left and that second question is what ideas do you have for promoting conservation goals and minimizing impacts of trail use again it's your breakout group so you guys kind of get to decide the direction but so can I just what, give what, a quick what, shout out to oh sorry go ahead Oh, I was going to just say that there's no one better here than Morris about getting people excited about trails. And just as far as that's how I came into trail building is through volunteers uh, for Outdoors California and was able to get a uh, better respect for all the work that it goes into the actual building of a trail and then learning about the concepts to build good trails. So, um, I just want to say that Morris is in the room and has um, been part of that effort. And it's that education. And then with the Ridge Trail is there's a lot of those different type of days where you bring people to the area. Um, and I think that's a lot of, you know, how you can get people to appreciate trails just more. It's not just that um, walking on them, but it's having those type of opportunities. And then in the trail running community for different endurance races, like you have to um, put in a certain amount of hours in order to run the race. Um, so there's a way of us to realizing that every year we have to put in so many hours um, because the trails are something that we use. And then it also is something that we have to give back to. And yeah, so that's what but you're the good guys. And it seems to me what we're really trying to deal with are the yahoos. 
or the people that are casual about trails or who have a feeling that, you know, it's my trail, I can do whatever I want. How, and, and that comes down to conservation issues too. Um, for instance, for what I was trying to get at with the bicycles, if they have a whole new variety of trails, uh, are there narrow trails who bicycles are allowed on now that could be closed in order to preserve the conservation values on those trails? Okay. I just wanted to, to say something about what Luana said, which is that uh, one of the biggest impacts of, of involving volunteers in trails, and I think this should be something that the district emphasizes uh, is involving volunteers in building the trails is that volunteers, once they've helped build the trail, never look at a trail in the same way again. They understand what causes erosion. They understand what causes environmental impact. And they're much more sensitive to those causes, both in their own behavior and in the behavior of others. So that's like, like something, uh, something that the district should, should look at incorporating more of rather than less. Um, and also, Suzanne? I'll note that, you know, to me, to me the, the park district over the years and whenever we've been building trails has always started with environmental considerations. And on trails that have been there forever, um, they have responded to overuse and, uh, and less than optimal uh, conditions by improving uh, environmental impacts. Uh, I'll give three examples. Um, one is in uh, Tilden Park, uh, what used to be called the Stream Trail, which is now called Wildcat Gorge Trail, the lower portion of it, goes along the stream. My, my stepson was baptized in Wildcat Creek 50 years ago um, in the pool at, where it turns towards uh, Lone Oak. Um, now that area is fenced off and the, fe the, the fencing goes all along the creek and there's been signs up saying dogs are not allowed in the creek. Recently, they've started putting up chicken wire or, or, or similar kind of netting to enforce that. Um, yes, the, same thing is, the same thing is true in Redwood Park along what's, what is still called the Stream Trail. They built all kinds of fencing there to keep people out of the creek. Um, in a similar manner, uh, in East Bay Mud, when you go over from the Arunda Connector Trail towards the uh, towards Brioni's uh, Reservoir, uh, I participated in a trail building project years ago where we took the trail and closed it off because it was too near the tree, creek and built a trail that was another 100 to 200 feet over further from the creek and built a new trail uh, to reduce the impact Good. on the creek. And so those are, those are the kinds of things that the park district can do when they're planning new trails and that they're more able to do when they're building new trails rather than when they're just incorporating old fire roads that happen to exist on a property they bought from some rancher. Suzanne. I've got a suggestion in the little time we have left uh, that feeds into the second question. I, I think the park should look at a program of adopting trails and having um, these user group organizations uh, take responsibility for impacts and usage and maintenance on different trails. Uh, I can see, uh, you know, people having in, in these groups, people having particular concerns about particular trails. And if a trail became identified with a user, with a, with a group, with an organization, there's someone to call when there are problems in addition to the park. The park should encourage, uh, for instance, my group TWHA could adopt a particular trail and when maintenance problems happen, the park could call us. When users see, uh, when trail users see problems or conflicts, they can call us and we can get out there and try to do education. Suzanne, so, how would that work with the park district and liability and even volunteers trail building? How much can the park do that? Usually volunteer trail projects are done uh, led by members of the park district, such as Suzanne, who's in this group, 
but also like in Tilden and Redwood with rangers from that group, they select what work needs to be done and the volunteers assist in accomplishing that work. So that, 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 that deals with liability. And in fact, all the volunteers sign a workers comp form so that they're covered in terms of any accident that might happen to them. Um, they're actually workers for a day with the park district. Can, can I throw in one quick suggestion before we leave? Um, permitting process for certain types of events. Um, let's say if you have a big biking event or a big running event, maybe there's a way that people from the event or who are gonna participate in the event have to do so many trail hours or there has to be a piece of trail education when they check in um, or maybe you pay less for a permit. Um, your organization puts in so many trail working um, hours. So maybe there's some way to create incentives. Um, and through that, there's people who might be using the trails a lot, but uh, now they have some type of um, incentive to promote um, that type of education or experience for those users. Yeah, let's get those users have having skin in the game, skin in the safety and in the uh, sustainability game. I think that's a great idea. Now, as someone who is who's spent many years trying to recruit people for those kinds of projects, it's worth noting that most people will not volunteer to do that. Um, but the ones that do spread the word and 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 have a real effect. Suzanne, Do we have somebody who's going to report uh, to the group? Have we selected somebody? We have not. I am here, Mimi. I was just taking notes from um, what uh, what I have you all saying. Uh, mostly just, I'm just going to recap real quick. And if somebody could, could think about it, if you're willing to volunteer, that would be great to report out. Um, for the, the first question, what assumptions do you think are important for the district to consider in developing new trails? Uh, we discussed um, that in the new park lands, there's going to be a lot of demand for trails, which takes some of the crowds from existing parks. So all trail user groups should have adequate opportunities for recreation in new park lands. There was the question of should narrow trails be open to bikes at all? Um, is the statement, it was easier to set up new trails with multi-use um, or the you know, future established use rather than add a new use or change. Planning should include environmentalists from the start to make sure impacts are minimal. Equity should be a big factor, building and opening trails in areas where there are not a lot of existing trails and recreational experiences now. Um, important to provide access for people, including youth who bike to parks or who do not have access to cars. Look at the surroundings, are there staples nearby or room for horse trailers in the parking lots? You should uh, reflect if that is the case. And then a lot of other comments we have in here about trail work. Sorry, go ahead. I think you should do the report. Yeah, I was you just don't have time saying. for notes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Okay. I know they, they prefer staff not do it, but I can do it because I got all the notes in front of me. So that's fine. Please add in something if you feel like I didn't capture it. Or can please you possibly add in share my your notes with, some, with us. Can you possibly share your notes with us somehow? Um, right now? I don't know. Yeah, in I which can. case, one it's of us. It's a Google really document cool. that Amanda has ultimate control of. I mean. yeah. We are breakout room two, and there may be some one or two other people joining us, but let's begin. And sure. um, let me share my screen quickly to show you the, the, um, the two kind of conversation starters that we want to try to address. Give me a second here. By the way, uh, Mary, did the background noise go away when I came inside the house? I think it's I think it's gone. Okay, let's assume it's the aircraft noise outside. Okay, so we have two questions that we want to try to address. Uh, can you see my screen? What assumptions do you think are important for the district to consider in developing new trails? And what ideas do you have for promoting conservation goals and minimizing the impacts of trail use? 
So this first question came out of a pre-meeting that we had with Pam and the conservationists, where basically the question was, what is everyone coming to the table with? And let's everyone kind of put their cards on the table and we kind of examine them. So we've changed that to be, what assumptions do you think are important for us at the district to consider in developing new trails? So maybe we could just do some brainstorming and I'll take some notes. Well, shall I, I jump I said, in? Or go oh, ahead. go ahead. You go. Oh, okay, so uh, in terms of assumptions, um, as in my capacity as an equestrian advocate, I would have to say that one assumption that immediately comes to mind is that if you are in a park location with nearby barns, equestrian centers, and uh, equestrian use, you've got to assume that there will be equestrians there. Uh, conversely, if you are in a park, say, uh, Thurgood Marshall, uh, Concord Hills, where there are no existing barns, you, there will not be equestrian use. So uh, the devil is really in the details on this stuff, and I think that uh, it's almost like you have to look at trails or potential new trails in a very granular fashion in order to uh, uh, get it right. Right. I, I, uh, this isn't this isn't really an assumption, but I just wanted to say I've I've been starting to feel that. Our conversation has been abstract long enough and we had to look at really how our trails built and, and where would they be built but um yeah the devil is in the details uh, yeah this is pam um i i just want to reinforce what brian holt said that um the human presence on trails has an automatic impact and we have quite a few trails already and i would like to see before um changes to the existing trails are, are initiated and before new trails are built for public access or um, for various uses, before anything changes, I would like to see the information um, and studies done on existing impacts and what the costs and needs are for uh, restoring damaged trails that are currently in uh, serious disrepair um, and I have examples of some of those that I can share. I like the underlying assumption that the parks are for people as well as plants and wildlife. I think if we keep coming back to that, we won't get off track. Parks are for people as well as plants and wildlife. Well, it's a balance. It's the, like when I did my book, I had to look at the fact that starting around the 1980s, the the balance between uh, conservation stewardship and uh, recreation was, it was all about finding the sweet spot between those two sets of values. I think we have to, we, we need to minimize impact, but we need to also accept that there, some impact is acceptable. The parks are not going to be the Galapagos Islands. Yeah, and cool. what are you, what are the and who decides the criteria for what impacts are acceptable? Well, I think this group is working on that. Do we have the expertise? No, we need professional environmentalists and professional recreational experts to actually make the call. We can advise, but I think you know a lot of us are are don't really have that background. I just jump in real quick. I'm sorry. I know I'm not supposed to be engaging in here, um, <laughs> but um, but the question of who decides, I think that is um, that is a, a decision for the board, and we do um, we do have that's why we have CEQA. We do environmental studies, um, and as staff, that's our goal is to evaluate the impacts, disclose the impacts, and then it's really a decision about um, you know. Um, what's what's the acceptable level? So sorry, just one time. Question, Brian. Um, could you just you know off the top say who's got the bigger budget, stewardship or planning? 
Um, I couldn't say that off the top of my head. I, I will say stewardship is we work very closely and we're in the same division. So you can't necessarily tease those two out um, because we're all part of acquisition, stewardship and development. So we're all working on the same projects. But if you if you take this dichotomy, just for, you know, for the sake of discussion, the dichotomy between uh, recreation and conservation, it seems that stewardship would be the advocates for conservation, whereas the trail designers are the advocates for public access. So how that's funded, I think, was is really a key. I would I would take I would take issue with that um, because um, what we plan for is resource protection just as much as recreation. Um, that was my intent as we start that. We're, I mean, that is the goal of planning and trail design is to identify those spaces and strategies for resource protection um, as well as public access. That it's not a competition. That is, it is what we're, what we're working towards. When I w worked in the world of engineering, we would sometimes have uh, the director of engineering would assign different engineers to be advocates for certain products that were being made or certain approaches. And that was, it was almost like not exactly adversarial, but it was almost like this trail users group where different advocates would uh, bring forth their uh, uh, a case in favor of, of, a, of an approach. So uh, you're saying that within the park district planning, there, it's much more collaborative than that. We work very closely with stewardship to understand, you know, the science end of things. We work as well with, you know, designers in terms of what can be designed. We hear from the stakeholders. Our goal as planners is to, to kind of take it all in and to identify, you know, what would be um, the most, you know, appropriate plan or design that meets the needs of the users um, and, and protect resources. So we look at restoration projects, we look to designate resource protection areas, we look at what um, sustainable trail design is. Um, and, uh, and so, for example, you know, we're you know, we're, we might have a area where there's a road that we don't think is sustainable or is eroding. And so we will propose removal of that road and, you know, but have to look at potential other trail connections to, to make that connectivity so people don't make their own connections. So these are kind of the conversations that we go through and we struggle through. So there's not a, like I say, there's not a recreation planning department. Um, it's all, you know, it's all, like I say, the first, first step is always sort of understanding what is the, what are the resource constraints and then also what are the there isn't actually a, an AGM for recreation, is there? There's an AGM for acquisition, stewardship, and development. And like I say, the master plan, we have the dual mandate to provide for natural and cultural resource protection while providing for public access. Thanks. I, I, I have a, a question about um, this extreme drought and if, um, if the, the if you all at the park are having conversations about how drought stressed some of the park areas are and whether there need to be new management uh, actions um, to address that. Very much so. Um, and that's always a, that's always a conversation. Um, I think you're probably familiar with what we're seeing of very large tree die off throughout the parks and um, working to try to try to address that. Um, so it's a big and an expensive project. So I'm going to I'm going to jump off here just because I'm not supposed to be the focus of this conversation. So I'm going to go jump into another breakout room. But I'm happy to Thank talk you. about this stuff anytime. So feel free to reach out. OK, thanks. Um, one thing I meant to do at the beginning was have you choose amongst yourselves for who would report back when we do do our report backs. Could we talk about that before we move on to I've been the taking topic? notes if you I'm happy to do it. I've been taking notes. I'll be I'll be fair. I will re represent all points of view. 
Thanks. Is that good for the, the rest of you? You're muted, Amelia. Amelia, you're muted. I'm sure Mary can do a fine job. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And, and we can all do it together. Heck, there are only three of us. Yeah, it's a smaller group. Well, I'm sorry, sorry, Devin. I'm sorry, Devin. Four. <laughs> yeah, but we, we, intended, we intended to have every group. Uh, in my experience, the female breakout groups are a lot more civilized than when you have <laughs> have a, a co-educational here. So that would be really interesting to know. Oh man, we we need someone to study that. He actually, I'm okay. Uh, we actually had women bicyclists and equestrians meet together, and it went great, you know. <laughs> but anyway, um, can you tell us a little bit about that? So with our, our topics are um, assumptions and ideas to promote conservation goals. So, you know, funding appropriate funding of studies so that we can study where the devil in the details uh, comes in with these trails. Like I heard of one agency where they said, well, if if 75% of the trail is safe for mountain bikes, then we'll let the mountain bikes go on the trail. And th there's like the Golden Spike Trail, there is one really horrendous area. And that one area is enough to make it not good for multi-use and so i think you know artificial indices like 75 percent are a setup for grief uh <laughs> so for, for what park is the golden spike trail in sorry uh what's what park is the golden spike trail in it's pretty close to the uh junction with the dunn there's uh it's a long story. Let's not go. Let's not go there. But yeah, okay. So I think what we need is uh, funding for a very thorough evaluation of proposed new trails. That's numero uno. I think if if we cover the funding for new trails, also the uh, McCosker experience has has or should have or should have sh has shown or should have shown us that that process did not work. It did not uh, prevent a lot of downstream problems. And I was you know angered and upset by the McCosker public comment process and would really like to see a much better approach to the public comment process when new uh, developments are contemplated. What do you mean by yeah, that? Yeah, and I'll add to that uh, in addressing the second question, uh, promoting conservation and minimizing impacts. Again, at McCosker, um, I never did see the, um, the baseline study uh, from the park regarding um, the most vulnerable wildlife, uh, for example, the nesting uh, ground bird species like the marsh harrier. There's a big field in McCosker and if that's not protected for nesting marsh harriers, uh, which is a protected species here in California, then um, it's a mistake to just go ahead and build trails and allow access uh, for recreation um, without at least knowing what is there and what the impacts will be to what is there. That's the whole purpose of a baseline study, which which wasn't shared, if it was even done. I don't, I don't see evidence of that being done at McCosker. So that's an example of what needs to be done before trails are open, before new trails are built. And the focus again should be on restoring damaged trails first and, and figuring out a way uh, to address the off trail activity that is now really overtaking some of the high value habitat and the conservation qualities in some of the parks. Um, I think and, if we restore, well, if we focus on restoring the current trails, we won't have any new trails in our lifetime because you know they're a lot. They're thirteen hundred miles of trails. Well, with this what do you what do you recommend? I think we have to focus. We have to open a few new trails and see how it goes. Do the work to get everybody on board and um, learn from our experience. Well, I still haven't heard your criteria for why we need n new trails. Well, because the population has tripled in the last 25 or 30 years. Um, the park district users have tripled or some multiple like that. If there aren't enough trails. People are squashed on the trails together and that's causing conflicts and erosion. 
you know, there's something That's funny. That's not necessarily the cause, but um, I think you're you're right that there does need to be um, a discussion about what is causing the problems because I think right now it's conjecture and anecdotal. I don't think we have actual evidence of, of what the cause actually is. Of the erosion of the conflict. He in, uh, in a recent board meeting said that he hiked the entire Bay Area Ridge Trail in segments and he said once you get away from the urban centers the population really thins out and that got my attention. It's very difficult for a lot of us to go far from the urban centers. We're seeing the congestion at the urban centers but there are a number of things where a pilot test needs to be run. Is, is it true what the bicyclists claim that by, redu by adding more trails and reducing, it will reduce density? Is it true that it will reduce trail conflicts? And is it true that it will re reduce the construction of road trails? Those are things that have been claimed, but they haven't been tested. Good point. Yeah. Um, Pam, you were talking about at McCosker, a bird, the marsh, I couldn't catch that. Harrier. Oh, it's the oh. Harrier, H-A-R-R-I-E-R. -R -R -E sure. I see. So you were never, um, if if the park district did baseline studies for McCosker, you were not, and the public was not availed of them. You, you could not see them. I, di I didn't see a, what I consider to be a full baseline study. Um, there, were, there were some reports of birds that may be in the area um, but 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 no evidence in the report of a full baseline study following the entire um, natural history of what birds might be nesting there over the course of one se breeding season. Not even one breeding season. I didn't see a report on that. There is this thing called the negative declaration under CEQA. And I, you know, you guys know more than I do about CEQA, but my impression is that once the coveted negative declaration is recorded, then all of a sudden they don't have to do baseline studies. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. If 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 an MNT is called a mitigated negative declaration, that's one form. Uh, there are other forms, and if that's approved, then they they don't have to undergo the full um, investigation. Was that the case at Nacosker? Uh, not negative. necessarily, um, because Nacosker um, is is kind of a of a special annex, if you will, under the land use plan amendment, as as I understand it. Um, I may not be remembering it correctly, but that's my memory of it. And the Cosker had the Cosker was really a can of worms. What's that? The Cosker had a what? What did you say, Devin? I was saying that McCosker had a full environmental impact report draft and final, unlike um, other parks where uh, lesser uh, CEQA review can be done. A mitigated negative declaration is a is a sort of a reduced um, level of review. But so the biology chapter of Cosker should have included all the things, Pam, that you're talking about. It sounds like either it wasn't disclosed or it wasn't done to the level that you would have expected. Um, but what, let's talk about some McCoskers in the past. Personally, just so you know where I'm coming from, I'm sort of with Mary. I believe that new trails are part of the solution and those new trails are gonna come in our land bank properties. So we're working in planning on Concord, now renamed Thurgood Marshall Regional Park home of the Port Chicago 50, that's a big milestone. And uh, I'm personally working with a colleague on Roddy Ranch, the golf course conversion. My other colleagues are working in Las Trampas and Clayton Ranch, we're still making some decisions about that. That's been in the works for, for years. Naoma mentioned this uh, new opportunities at Chenard and there's some properties that are in Land Bank that are being studied now. So I think uh, there's a lot of potential for new trails sort of in the short-term horizon of, you know, two, three years, something like that. But there's a feeling that things need to happen sooner than two years. No one can wait two years for a new trail. So um, at least some, some users can't wait. Or the amount of trail conflict we have cannot be sustained without people 
uh, being hurt or so disappointed in their park system that they don't support it anymore. So I think it would be a mistake to not pay close attention to the lessons of McCosker. Yeah. Now, your your feelings about McCosker have to do with process and uh, and the, um, I guess it, you would be disappointed, I suppose, in the end results of who gets to use which trails or where the trails would be. But are there other land bank areas that you could see besides the ones I've just mentioned? Are there other land bank areas off the top of your head you could see where you know there's not as much you know, conservation or threatened species habitat value, areas where we should be focusing? Well, look at Roddy Ranch, okay. Uh, I realize right now the task is to look at the golf course and that's where the bicyclists would like to have their uh, their pump track. Uh, but there's this tendency uh, among uh, planners in the park district to silo uh, their, their vision of, of development for an area. And so if you're gonna look at the Roddy Ranch golf course, that's gonna connect to uh, a regional trail perhaps that connects to Black Diamond Mines and will change use patterns in Black Diamond Mines. It will also potentially impact the equestrian center at the Roddy Barn where Mr. and Mrs. Roddy intend for there to be a youth equestrian area. So uh, I think you need to look beyond the dots, the dotted lines on the map and see what the systemic impact is of new trails as you develop. Mm -hmm. Just so you know, on Roddy, um, the planning we're doing is just the boundaries of the golf course and there'll be fencing around. So people will not be able to go down to the Roddy home ranch not until we want them to, you know, there's a vision of having a whole um, education center there, just like you mentioned, that's that's uh, in a longer term uh, project. Our immediate planning now, and Amelia, if you're interested, we'll, we've got a community meeting coming up on July 1st. July 1st, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if you're on our list or any, I think we put everybody on the, the trail user working group on our mailing list for Roddy. That way, I, I wondered. Yeah, that's why we, we added you just because we know that that's the next park that's sort of in the works right now, or well, one of them. Got it. I, I, I was fortunate enough to do a, tour, a hike with Bob Doyle at Roddy Ranch itself, the homestead. Oh, thank oh my God, what, what an incredibly beautiful place. Yeah, especially in the spring, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great opportunity for uh, this new generation of kids of color who want to ride horses. It's just beautiful setup, and uh, we want to do everything we can to support those visions and make it happen. But the the bicycle and horse on the same trail thing has to be looked at here. And you know, it, my environmentalist friends may disagree with this, but I think you know, give the bikes conquered hills. You know, it's it's not going to impact equestrian use. Do you, Amelia? Do you think there'll be equestrians at um, at conquered hills? Do you, would you ride a I horse there? I think it's improbable. I think it's improbable. I think it's really a very good setup for uh, for bicycle use there. And uh, so it's between the bikers and the environmentalists there. It's existing uh, parklands with existing equestrian use where there needs to be a close look at preventing conflicts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nobody rides horses at Concord Hills. It's a former military establishment, although the uh, China Lake Naval uh, Air Weapons Station in the Mojave Desert has got amazing canyons with perfectly preserved petroglyphs and large herds wow. of wild mustangs and burros because the military has just let it be fallow. And, and I'm sure there's desert species of interest and wonderful habitats there. So anyway, I don't know about the habitats on Concord Hills. It's above my pay grade, but there's, <laughs> it, it need not be preserved as an equestrian park, in my opinion. <laughs> Others may disagree. Well, one of the, the big parts of Concord, um, the reason it's a park at all, is that it's conservation mitigation for the huge development that the city of Concord will be building, you know, thousands right. of homes and 
millions of square feet. So, um, so the, you know, there's Alameda Witch Lake habitat, there's California tiger salamander habitat, there's a golden eagle nest that has been breeding for many years on the top of the eucalyptus at the top of the ridge in Concord. So there's definitely a lot of habitat there. And there's whole areas that are gonna be off limits to the public. But um, we've got about five minutes. Do we want to sort of sum up for Mary so she can report back accurately? Yeah. What do you got? That, that would be that would be really handy. Hang on. So the first we had two questions. One is assumptions. Um, let me figure out how I can do this. Both take notes and read my notes. <laughs> okay. You heard the ripping here. So assumptions. Um, yeah, I'm already lost. So Amelia <laughs> said that if 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 you're if you're near a place that has barns and stables, you can assume they're going to be horses and equestrians. And we should start looking at new trails in a granular fashion, which I think I agreed with because I'd like it to be less abstract. You know, um, I think looking at some real trails would help. Hang on, I'm making a note so I don't blow this. Um, Pam said that human presence has an automatic impact, and we have a lot of that already. Is that right? Oh, that, that it should be assumed that that um, trails with people on already represent an impact that needs to be managed. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to put needs to be managed. That's a good way to put it. Okay. Um, and the. We should consider doing studies. We want studies done uh, before we have we do these things. We need to know what we're doing, what impact we're having. Um, I suggested that parks are for people as well as plants and wildlife. I thought that kind of died. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a very good point and you should make it, but there's also this question of the dichotomy uh, or as Brian said, uh, a synthesis. Yeah. I think Amelia said we should find, I'm not going to attribute this to all of you guys because I'll say forever if I do this, but so we should find the sweet spot, which Amelia said actually. Um, and then who makes the call? Who, who decides? We're here advising. Who eventually makes the call? That's where Brian came in and said it was the board. Um, hang on a second. I'm numbering my pages now. Um, yeah, you hear you hear managers say that they serve at the board's pleasure, but you hear the board say that they're looking to the trail users working group or they're looking to the staff recommendations. My experience, the board signs off on whatever the staff recommends. Yeah. By the time it gets to the board, it's done. Almost nothing will stop it. Um, we should look at the McCosker process maybe and figure out if it went wrong, how it went wrong. Um, people seem pretty unhappy if, on all sides about that. Devin, you're looking uneasy. It's, I'm just saying what the group said. <laughs> um, well, my discussed... dear friend Morris thinks that, that it was just a brilliant process and he can't understand why somebody threatened to sue. <laughs> <laughs> um, we talked about maybe having some pilot new trails. We talked about the need for new trails at all is there really a need? And we talked about, uh, and then the other point of view was, yes, we need new trails. And, and, and then a third aspect of that was, if we do new trails, we should do some pilots and see what the impact is. You've okay. done a great job of capturing all the main points. You know, don't say that till later. We'll see how this goes. Um, We've got about 45 more seconds until we get brought back to the main group. God. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes, One thank you, guys. Civilized conversation here. Yes, oh, it's because it's women, right? Sorry, Devin. Yeah, well, Devin, you can you can you can lurk in our in our group here. <laughs> yeah. We need a support group for the men. The, yeah, right, right, right. We're too hard on them. Yeah, but it's fun. Hello. Hello. Now, where is that trail in your background? It looks that like one, to me. that is Pleasanton Ridge. 
Pleasanton Ridge. Yeah, I think that's the Ridge Line Trail, if I'm not mistaken. Hi, hi, Sean. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Uh, hi, Jim. Hi, Ian. You guys have great backgrounds. I liked, your, <laughs> I liked your presentation, Jim. Thank you. This is this is complicated. Um, and <laughs> Sean could probably comment on that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's a challenge, but we I'm glad we're working through it. We've got a lot of a lot of details to sort out as we go forward, but I think this is a great first step is just getting the getting the folks to the table and really hashing through some details. So um, I'm happy to be here. I'm going to planning meetings and you know, the presentations to the public type meetings. And uh, it's just amazing how complicated it is just to put parking and they want to put a little bit of parking and then you've got 40 neighbors opposing it. And it's just really, um, I yeah. try and find all those secret entrances that they don't publicize where you can but I don't block people's driveways, so, I, you know. Yeah, please don't. That causes all sorts of troubles, as I'm sure you know. Yeah. I, don't look, I don't look very, uh, you know, I park somewhere good and then I tiptoe in and nobody seems to object. <laughs> I don't mean illegal. I mean, you know. Oh, I know, they're, yeah. But they're not publicized. Supported. <laughs> Just kidding. But hey, Scott. Hey, Becky. Hello. Hello. Uh, I don't know how many we're expecting, but this seems like we're probably, I'm assuming we're all, we're pretty much there. I think I was one of the last people to be assigned or. Okay. And I think we had, was it 35 minutes? Am I correct in that for the mm -hmm. breakout? I don't have the agenda in front of me, but um, at any rate, uh, maybe we should get going on it. So I, I'll be, uh, I'll be here to answer any questions that I can, or if you have to, anything to throw at me, but this is ideally um, supposed to be you guys talking through these, these areas of concern. Um, but I'll take the notes down and um, we do need a presenter to give when we get back to the greater group. Is there anyone that wants to step in for that? I don't we, mind we can, doing it. I'll keep track. You'll do it, Kathy? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, well, let's start here. If you guys, I'll, like I said, I'll start taking notes, but feel free to throw out ideas and I'll try to keep up as much. And maybe if we have time, we can review them just so we make sure we're all on the same page as, as I've typed them. Um, so I don't know everyone here because I'm- Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, yeah. Doing introductions. Yeah. Um, Becky, why don't you start? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Becky Tudin. Um, I am in uh, Park District, the Stewardship Department. I'm the Ecological Services Manager. Uh, and I've, um, I've gone to a few of these working groups, but I really have not been a, a participant, but I wanted to come to this um, conservation uh, session. So nice to, to be here. I, I'm, I'm afraid I have to leave at 1130, but um, okay. I'm good to go. Well, we appreciate you being here, Becky. And I work with Becky quite a bit, being the trails program, trails development program, our name changes every little bit. But anyway, we work, my team and hers worked quite um, quite close in various projects um, from beginning to end. And uh, I'm very happy she's here and can attend. So um, how about we go through, Jim, do you want to say, um, say a quick something about yourself, just so folks that don't know you? Sure. I occasionally have hung around the park district offices when, when they were open, but uh, Jim Hansen, um, Volunteer Conservation Committee Chair for East Bay, you know, California Native Plant Society. Thanks. How about you, Kathy? Uh, well, I am here um, as an off-leash dog walking proponent, but I actually really am a conservationist. I do um, uh, native plant restoration and mm. fire abatement with Save Mount Diablo. I do not speak for them in any way, but, uh, and I live in Oakland, but I've spent a lot of time out in the Marsh Creek Road, Morgan Territory Road area, and I have mm. a huge interest in getting um, Clayton Ranch and Hanson Hills and all those um, new acquisitions opened up, um, hopefully in my lifetime. Um, nice to meet you. How about you, Ian? Uh, I'm, I'm with Ian Baird. I'm with president of the Renda Hiking Club. Um, we have about 350 members. Uh, we have about nine, nine day hikes a month. We have domestic trip uh, hiking groups to the uh, other states and we have international trips to other countries. Um, 
We donate monies to East Bay Regional Park District to the Ivan Dixon uh, Trail Maintenance Program. We actually donate monies to about seven different organizations that uh, build and maintain trails because we're using them all the time. Uh, as a hiking group, we, we use the East Bay Regional Park District parks on a regular basis. So we're very interested in conservation and uh, we're very interested in the hiking trails and having them maintained well. So that's it. Very good, thank you. And last but not least, Scott. I'm Scott Bartlebaugh. Um, I'm on the Trail User Working Group representing cycling interests. Um, I'm the advocacy director for Bicycle Trails Council of the East Bay, um, but I also enjoy uh, hiking and hiking with my dog. Um, so like most people, I use the trails in several different ways. Um, I'm also the lead trail steward for BTCEB at Crockett Hills, where um, over the past uh, three years, we're averaging about 500 volunteer hours per year. Um, so we try to put back heavily. Um, we work with Sean on, on some of those projects. Um, so we do try to, uh, to help out um, and, and not just uh, advocate for more access. Um, so. Great. Well, nice to meet everyone. Nice to meet you. So with that, uh, let's just get into uh, question number one here. Um, what assumptions do you think are important for the district to consider in developing new trails? Here, maybe I'll share my screen too. Let's see. What assumptions? Well, certainly to uh, preserve the environment and to minimize the impact of new trails on the environment. So I would preserve, I just got to preserve the environment and preserve, what was that second bit? Oh, uh, preserve the environment and preserve all, oh, I all think... the, features, the features of the environment. Okay. I thought you said minimize um, impacts of the trails on the environment. In, okay. And minimize, yes, and minimize the impact of trails on the environment. All right. Do you have anything else they want to add to that bit? Um, I think there are, are certain areas that are more sensitive than others. And I think um, part of the, the district mission is to provide recreation opportunities as well. Um, and, and there are a range of recreation um, opportunities that, that are valid in the parks. Um, I mean, here we're talking about trails, but they also provide golf courses, swimming pools, other things that are, are very much more specialized um, that, that have a range of impacts. And some of those are, are higher impacts if we're paving over um, the, the landscape, um, that's not available as habitat. Let me see, swimming. Uh, let's see, what other, you had another couple examples in there, but. Staging uh, he, he said Staging golf areas, yeah. Golf course, that's what it was, yes. It was golf course, yeah. But maybe yeah. there's other things that are Just not so oriented, that are more physical structures. Um, Do you have camping? Do you have camping in any of the parks? Yes. Mm -hmm. Camping? We have designated campgrounds, and then we also have um, backpack camps. You have camping facilities and also uh, yeah, picnic facilities. Correct. So I did hear someone say, and I'm just repeating this, and I'm, I'm wondering if it might also be helpful to discuss what um, areas we don't think are agreed upon assumptions, you know, just so that they might require more discussion or more clarification, but I did hear someone say that 
I think it was Pam Young from Audubon um, that any trail does have um, an impact. You know, when you're bringing people to a new area, there is going to be an impact. That's just a base assumption. Yes. And, and I think that it's really I'm true sure. that on many of these things, we're going to end up agreeing to disagree, but we can look for areas of agreement. And as um, someone just said, looking for ways to minimize the um, impacts. And I just wanted to add to the first uh, thing of assumptions is looking to the future and looking to change in population densities and their areas uh, like the, the new Eastern acquisitions that right now do not have a large population base that may or may not in the future have um, a population growth depending how development goes. So I think that it's important to um, consider where people are gonna be living 25 years from now. I'll just, ahead, jump, I'll just jump in. Um, Kathy, I just drove back from um, the foothills over the weekend and saw the new building along 24 in Antioch. So it looks like it's still booming. Um, but I wanna add, I think in terms of assumptions that are important to look to, I, I do think the connections, and I, th I really thought that map was helpful to land bank properties, the connections to existing parks. Uh, what, is, what is ever done with trails that affects current trail use in the existing parks it really stood out for me. Um, I think that, um, yeah, I had a few other notes, but I can't read them. Uh, but anyway, that, that was one that came up. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Well, we can add to that too. But if you guys, it looks like we're, I'm getting a 1135 we're going to. So we got some time to really suss it out too. And if you guys want, we can move on to number two and come back to number one if you want as well. Oh, you got something, Scott? Yeah, I'd like to discuss a little bit minimizing impacts of trails on the environment. Um, okay. I, I think if we're looking at it in the big picture, to, to get the minimum impact of trails on the environment means we have zero trails. Okay. Um, or or that, that's one way to take that. And I'm not, I'm not sure it was meant that way, but- No, no it wasn't meant that way. It, uh, right, but in the big picture, that that would be the way to get zero impact. Um, yeah, I, I think, think I, um, on trails though, we want to, where we decide to build trails, we want to minimize the impacts that we saw from, from braiding, perhaps, Jim. You showed a lot of pictures of that where there are multiple routes rather than a single route. Trails become wider and there's more impact from that perspective. And, and there's more impact from, from other uses. Um, well, Scott, doesn't that come down to engineering and designing? It has to be engineered well, so braiding is not an option. Part of that is meeting the, the, the desires of the users as well, because um, people will shortcut trails um, because they want to get from A to B, and the, the long route is not interesting enough to them. Um, so I think there are a variety of factors there. Um, and design is, is one piece of that. Well, that's part of that's education because none of our hike leaders, our leaders of our hikes are allowed to break trail and go across undeveloped land. Not everybody is on a leader led hike. Some people go out and hike on their own and make their own decisions. And some of those people, no matter what their mode of transportation is, will decide to go off trail or, um, those things happen with, with all user groups. And some of that is driven by the design. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's see, I'll jump in and say, I think what's, what's really occurred to me is that there really are differing impacts. Um, and there's a lot of hikers, there's a lot of people on the trails. When I compare that to a uh, what appears to be a, a much smaller population, the mountain biking impacts are really are really evident. And in the braiding I saw at Pleasanton Ridge to even off the fire roads and so forth. Um, I think that has to be considered in where trails are placed. I think the, the larger demand because of the impact 
on, in some cases, on narrow trails for uh, the on-foot user or the assisted user or the equestrian have to be considered in the trail design and really made explicit. So, yeah, so I think there are, I mean, I'm just seeing differing impacts and it just becomes so, so visible. Um, you know, and then are these, are these uh, notions of alternative days, things like that, are they, are they real fixes? I think we ought to have a in-depth in discussion about those um, before they become as, as, as input to the district about whether those are, are really effective or useful and where. So, so Jim, it sounds like you're saying that you don't think that we should have an assumption that having alternate days will work. Well, Becky, I really look forward to that discussion. Um, well, and, I, yeah, I don't, I don't see it. I, um, I, can, I, see. I, can, I could see like in more areas where, in some other areas, like maybe, maybe like, I think it's used around Lake Tahoe, but there's so many folks who just say, hey, let's go out to the park. And they, they're not gonna check the website. They, they're gonna go, oh, we get there and it's a Friday afternoon and it's off limits. I think it could be from a management perspective, in terms of conflict and confusion, I think it would, it just seems really difficult. So. Right. No, I just want to clarify that you're, I mean, some people might say they assume that having alternate days would work, but you're just saying you're not comfortable with that assumption. And I wanted to also ask a question about the um, mountain biking impacts. Are you saying that if a trail were well designed, you don't, do you think it would still show impacts for mountain bike use? Or do you think it is possible to design a narrow trail or trails that mountain biking wouldn't have any impacts on? You know, you know that you wouldn't see what you you think you've been seeing. I, I'm not sure I got that question. I, there are two parts to that. So, I yeah. think what I'm, go ahead. I, I think that um, with alternate days, uh, there's two issues, and one issue is that alternate days would certainly help the experience for the hikers. Uh, if you had a trail where a lot of mountain bikers wanted to you know, really do it and not have to worry about the hikers. That would help that, but it wouldn't help the erosion issues. Um, and the other thing is that I think most people just arrive at the park. Um, they haven't maybe even looked at the map and they just start out. Um, and uh, they're probably, unless there's a huge amount of signage or enforcement, I'm not gonna really respect all these, um, all these rules because they're going there to be free. Um, you know, they're going there to get away from all that. Yeah, I think trying alternate days would, would take a significant effort to, to change the culture and educate folks. Um, but I think it is something to consider. Um, but, but it comes with those implementation pieces that, that are significant. I mean, I think it might work in a, in a small local area where it was like highly pursued. Uh, uh, you know, say somewhere maybe like jo Joaquin Miller, which I know is not East Bay Parks. But if you're talking about somewhere like Briones, it's huge. It's got a million entrances. People are just going to park and do what they do. I mean, hmm. It, it could be implemented on a trail by trail basis. And if, if there's signage there and there's communication and you can get the, the users of the park to buy into it. Um, and, and they all agree that their experiences would be improved by it, I, I think there's a chance that the, the culture w could adopt it. And, and I think that's where it goes back to the environmental consideration that Kathy just brought up. Um, if that, I think that has to come first because what we again, I just, I, I just see a pattern of the banking on the trails um, of the, you know, the shortcuts. So it could be alternate days, but the environmental effects uh, we're, we're still likely to see. And so I don't know how that would address that piece of it. I would, if I could chime in, I would just have to say that um, we're just talking right now, we just have alternative use, alternate use days. Um, and I, I think that could definitely be used in certain situations, but that's, that's just one tool out of many that could be considered. Um, 
So maybe we should move on to some other ones that, that come to mind as well. And I'm sure there's going to be overlapping themes to this, but do you guys have anything, other ideas for, let's review number two here is what ideas do you have for promoting conservation goals and minimizing the impacts of trail use? So um, I think that there's a lot of upland areas that are sort of expanses of basically um, wild oat grasses and things like that, that really are, I mean, they're already kind of despoiled by cattle ranching and they're not that sensitive. And now I'm not a biologist and someone can assess this, but I think that we're really talking about a, a, a couple of hundred thousand acres and that areas can be found for people to let loose. And then there's areas um, along streams and whatever that uh, are very sensitive and should be uh, really limited. Mm -hmm. Well, Kathy, and I think that's that's really getting at this bigger picture of and and actually I'm really grateful that stewardship is, I think, doing the beginning work on evaluating habitat areas, uh, kind of park wide. Um, but it does get at where different uses uh, are impacts are minimized. Um, so in some cases. At McCosker, we, uh, we, we found out that one of the areas where trail was planned um, was an area of actually sensitive native grassland and, and also, so, so there's some areas that actually are not fully evident at the time. Sometimes you can find out if it's a serpentine area, and, but you're right, there are a lot of um, kind of grazing lands that are mostly annual uh, annual weeds that are good for cows. <laughs> yeah, I, right. I, I mean, obviously, like they have to have a biological assessment and find those areas of native grasses and not put it there. I, I mean, I was at that meeting and everyone kind of agreed on that. And then afterward, it became very contentious and um, uh, it was kind of sad to see. Because when they were talking about that, they talked about rerouting the proposed trail through uh, away from the native grasses. And um, I mean, that still could be done. I'm not sure politically it will be possible, but um, biologically it would be possible. Well, I'm gonna put my favorite out there, which is I really think that the ranch roads are not desirable trails for many. <laughs> And I, um, I've seen Sean's group um, design some excellent trails that don't have the um, erosion and uh, you know the impacts that we see. So I, I, I would love the removal of some of those ranch roads and then more thoughtful placement of trails. And I think that would go a long way to minimizing some of the impacts. So Becky, can the trails be designed so that it minimizes the desire of people to cross it, to cut across and uh, you know, make a rogue trail? I will let um, Sean, who is the expert, answer that. But my understanding is, yes, you can design them. It's, it's a landscape architect thing where you, you, you sort of, I, go ahead, Sean, you're better at this than I am. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate that. And I think Scott alluded to this earlier, but uh, yeah, it, it comes down to trail design isn't just about, um, you know, designing a, a route through a habitat while, you know, minimizing the impacts to it. It's also about understanding where people are going and where they want to go and what they're doing while they're out there. So part of sustainable trail design isn't, is, also, is beyond just minimizing the impacts of the, the ecosystem in the, the surrounding area. It's also about um, maximizing the experience that people want in an appropriate manner. So you steer them in ways you go, you steer them the trail away from areas that might be sensitive so that they they either don't even know about it or they don't have the opportunity to, to find it. Um, so we call them positive control points and negative control points essentially is the positive are the ones where you wanna bring people to the great vista or the water fountain or just their back to their car or whatever the case is, the sensitive negative impacts might be that bird nesting area or that sensitive riparian zone uh, for instance. So use those, but you we oftentimes will use the visual landscape to uh, block people from those areas. Um, and it can be challenging because each different user group has different tendencies to do um, you know, maybe to cut through areas or not, or um, fall line trails. Sometimes people will see the trail down the, the hill and they'll, they'll 
hike right down to it or bike or request and all, all trail users have their tendencies and if you can understand those you can better adjust um, address those in new trail design but um, the challenge is is also addressing those in an appropriate manner and uh, identifying how that happens and that takes time in, in the planning process yeah I think designing the trail so it's um, interesting to, to the users helps keep them on the trail and, it, and again I've got to bring in the trail experience by the different users um, we have people who have will not go to certain parks they they I think it's a well-designed trail it's a narrow trail but it has been designated as multi-use or actually it's not multi-use and it's being used in particular by mountain bikers anyway and people are coming up from behind jumping into the poison oak um, and we're just hearing that this is not working <laughs> um, I don't know how we, I, I think we have to look at how we do that. Now, my experience, part of my research was walking on East Trail over in Redwood. And honestly, there, there was just no issue. Um, when I walk at the Wildcat out here, um, I could go by fast, but it was wide enough that it was like, okay, well, to go too fast, but it's not uh, it's not an issue for just my experience of the trail and the other people there with dog or with their family or with stroller and things like that. I do just look at physics at times about how you put things through a pipe um, and you have to expand it with uh, different kind of speeds and so forth. I don't know. I, I think I think you're sounds like you're really kind of putting a great deal of thought at it to this and then there are just certain uh, experiences for that trail user on a narrow trail. Um, anyway. So, yeah, I mean, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, I, I think building more trails is part of the solution um, because I think demand is exceeding capacity. And mm -hmm. so th there's behavior by all, all user groups. Uh, and I don't know what to extent by user group of uh, road trails, shortcutting, um, trying to find that experience that they're not able to find for, for whatever reason, and, and things are out of control. Whereas if there are more opportunities that are designed to keep users on trails, then we probably have much less environmental impact um, by, by directing users to those locations. So I just had a question, Jim, about what you said. It sounds like you were on one multi-use trail that you felt worked on the East, East Ridge in Redwood and then on another multi-use trail that didn't work. No, in... they, no, they both were great. Oh, they both worked. Okay. Yeah. So, then, so then you do think multi-use trails, if designed appropriately or whatever, could work. Yeah, I, I really okay. think, I know, I know there was at the trails workshop a while back, it was like, mm, let's move away from fire roads. I think they've been really successful. Um, and they, I think they have a role in our trail program. Um, and I also think about just with the, the fire issues that there will be needs for access. And it's better they can use the road rather than, you know, kind of drive along across the landscape if it's a big fire vehicle. That's a new thing in the, the picture. No, they, just they've been... Both been very effective. Let me just say as a bicyclist real quickly on the Bay Trail and other places, um, I don't like coming across people, even with the bell, they don't, they don't know where to look. Um, having space, it just makes it so much easier to uh, not disrupt that conversation that they're having um, and, and go around them without yeah, causing a lot of jumping. So. Scott's heard me say this but Jim, before. Um, I don't disagree about those trails, but aren't both of those trails are um, are wide? The East Ridge Trail and the West Ridge Trail. Yeah. I mean, they're maybe not the West Ridge is maybe not quite as wide as the fire road, but basically, I mean, I, I think of them basically as fire roads. Yes, yes. And, and, and they work really well for me as a, as a different kind, as a user of different, both bikes and walking. 
And I see it working with the horses too. I've seen all three pass at one time easily. I think fire roads are a part of the spectrum, but I think they're more um, kind of thoroughfares to, to move large amounts of users. Um, so they're good for that um, and, and kind of main arteries. Um, but when they have really steep grades, I, I think they start losing their value to, to all user groups. Um, and, and they have higher environmental impact as well. Looking at that trail behind Sean in the photo, um, well, that looks like a trail could conceivably be a multi-use trail. It's fairly wide. It's got good sight lines. It's not too steep. Um, but there are just so many trails that are steep and don't have sight lines, and you're not going to cut down the trees to create sight lines. Right. Well, we um, that trail is that's in Pleasanton Ridge, and, and that's uh, multi-use. It, it, it you can see though it's running. If I can get my head out of the way, it's running damn near level there. So it's uh, that that does have some grade reversals to it. But the challenges are in the, when you try to get the contour going up and down the hill, and that's where you need a lot of grade reversals to address the water, but also opportunities to allow people to see each other. Um, and oftentimes we'll use trees, trees and other. Let's, you know, items out there, whether it's rocks or hillsides or outcroppings to, uh, to anchor a trail turn to allow people to, to not cut it as much as, as some people do. That's where we often find time to find the switchbacks and the, the user tra created trails is where people are trying to get around something to get to the other section of the trail. Um, so we always try to take those things into consideration. And, but I, I do know what Scott was talking about. Definitely the ranch roads, um, they, they do have some steep grades and environmental impacts that can be quite challenging to them, but they do have value, um, both recreationally and for infrastructure, what we call EVMA, emergency vehicle maintenance and access. Um, but they aren't perfect for everybody. They, they are, again, there's a spectrum. And um, I think the opportunity that we need to really focus on is just looking for multiple opportunity or multiple solutions to the, these very complicated problems and, and considering them all and weighing the pros and cons for each of them. But, but I'm not here to talk, I'm here to listen and write. So I'll, no, I'll, I'll show up there, but- uh. <laughs> Show on a question, show on a question. Yeah. When you design trails through virgin territory, do you design both narrow trails and wider trails? Yes, um, depending on the situation and the need, um, whether or not they are, uh, whether or not they're utilized for recreation and uh, you know maintenance activities or emergency, you know have you know used for fire maintenance or, or other things like that. We do use wider trails. Um, typically, what we're the more demand is for those narrower trails by all the, all the user groups out there want the narrow trail that immerses you into the experience, gets you into the, the view shed and the, the so nature. For the, na for the narrow trails, do you design them such that if different types of users meet each other, one of those users has to step off the trail to allow the other one by? We, we look for opportunities to make those, those happen as much as possible, um, but we also do rely on people to use their, their own uh, considerations in trail etiquette to know the, the hierarchy of the trail users out there but we do try to take that consideration we have a design we don't want to go too steep of a slope where it's not safe for people to pass or at least provide those opportunities hi linus hello how are you both doing today good hi Simone? great presentation yeah. neoma yeah. yeah thank you a little longer than it should have been, but <laughs> I was trying to keep it short. It's easy to go on. <laughs> Linus, I'm not sure if we can hear you. No. Yeah, no. Nope. Hear, hear me now. Ooh. Oh, now yeah, I can hear you. Good. No, I was just trying to say hi. Hi. Hi, Simone. Hi, Nyama. Nice job. I've been smiling at your burrow photo most of the morning. I don't know where you took that shot, but the. Uh, is it a donkey or a burrow that's coming at you in that photo? It's just a little horse. It was on just a, a little horse. Yeah, he was a, probably just a couple that's, years old, but yeah. That's a punchline, isn't it? Why can't why couldn't the why couldn't the uh, why couldn't the pony yeah say something or whatever? Because I'm a little horse. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. No, 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 it's fine. Um. Hi, you guys. Hi. Hello. Nice job, Norman. Nice job, Mimi. I was moved by your presentation. It's very 
very personal. It's good. Trying to get to the core of things here. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a well, the, at least the blend of things, it's sort of antiphonal, but something, some mix in the middle, hard to know. Rest. Hello. Hello. Only thing that I that keeps jumping out at me is that Naoma presumes that she owns Rancho Panole. It keeps showing up on her map as hers. It's Minus like she we're owns working. all the land. I'm working on I'm working with GIS. I have your email. We're working on changing that. Um, yes. Yeah. Neither owned nor operated by, but uh, it's still yours. I know. <laughs> I think it had to do with the measure WW decision back in the day um, in order to have something on the map. But no yeah, worries. no, no, no. And we're we working really, on it. really benefited from that. So I'm just kidding. But I think it actually, I think Bob put a stake in the ground there because we received some funds from uh, NOAA. And the yeah. NOAA funds had to be handled by an agency. And so there's a 50% of one parcel. And 50% of one parcel equals the entire. Uh, Pinole Valley watershed now, so we appreciate. It. <laughs> I think we need to That's focus on sometimes. what we're doing. I hit record. I don't know if any. I yeah, I hit record, Norman. Oh, okay. um, it's, I yeah, I... I started recording when we joined oh. the breakout room. We lost Mimi though. Where'd Mimi go? I think Mimi was actually supposed to be in another room, so oh. I think she got transferred to another room. Okay. So um, yeah, Amanda's prompting us, so I think maybe we're all here. Um, I. So. Well, I mean, Who wants to report back, I guess, is the question. Well, I, I'll report back, I guess. Okay. Okay with everybody. That's fine. I'm on vacation today, actually, so <laughs> I'll take a break from, <laughs> from reporting. <laughs> Norma, you've already been uh, accused of inaccurate uh, yellow journalism, so you're, you're, you're going to have to be careful what you report, but there you go. Um, so I'll be, I'll also be taking notes, but let's get started with the first question and then um, I'm going to mute myself so I'm not disturbing you guys, but uh, what assumptions do you think are important for the district to consider in developing new trails? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think I'll let other people speak because I had the presentation, but I think a lot depends on what it is it, what is it that the mountain bike community really wants out of the, all of this? I mean, it's, that's the thing I've been asking from the beginning, because we really need to know that. Uh, you know, do they want another Crockett Hills? Do they want all trails open? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, that's critical. And then the other assumptions is how, you know, how we plan in regard to accommodating that, whatever it is that they really want. I mean, may not be accommodatable in its entirety, but maybe there are ways we can accommodate it. Norm, just to, to question, so did you not feel like you got the answer to uh, that you weren't able to get that information from the mountain bikers perspective meeting? No, I didn't. Because it, what, one, I don't want to put words in their mouth or your mouth or anybody's, uh, but, you know, is it, is it that they want all the trails and all the parks opened up? Oh, I, I think that that, um, well, I guess I, I, I do remember from the presentation that I think that every trail user group probably would love to have a trail to themselves, but I, I do think that they do want more access to more trails, but not multi, not all multi-use trails for, you know, for all purposes was, was what I remember the outstanding message being. I mean, I think that, I think there could be an accommodation that there be certain trails that would be mountain bike only. In certain parks and then you'd have to look at the environmental impacts and issues there i mean one of the issues with the sibley mccosker was that a trail was going to be that was going to be for all users was going to be run through a particularly very sensitive native habitat area uh, and the park district had not looked at that and they were running the trail through there and it was we all said wait a minute you can't do that and that was that was that was one of the issues that brought halt to the planning at, at simply McCosker three years ago. Naomi, could you repeat the question? Yeah. So the question is, uh, what assumptions do you think are important for the district to consider 
with developing new trails. So, um, you know, I'm sort of taking that, we really wanna make sure that we understand, or Norman would like to, to make sure he understands what, what do the mountain bikers, and, and really the district, so the district really understands what mountain bikers want um, in terms of, of trail, um, in, in developing new trails. They want access to all trails or just more access. Um, and then, you know, are there other assumptions that we should be looking at? It sounds like, I'm also gathering from Norman that maybe there's, um, you know, making sure that we really understand the natural biological communities that are on the ground. Um, I can't, no, I, you know, instead of it, so the, the question though being, what should the park district consider? Instead of it being so parametric as to, well, therefore, how do we decide what each group might want to have considered for itself? It seems to me that the, the one basic assumption for the park district would be that it is a limited resource like water, like, you know, that there, there may come a tipping point with respect to uh, demographics where there is, there is only so much resource that can be um, used to accommodate any particular use. So how do, how do you begin to contemplate a cap? Damage, no damage, whatever, whatever the use. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not infinite. And I do think that, um, of course, speaking from the Ridge Trails perspective, connectivity is really important, even though, you know, a lot of these new land bank properties won't be, except for this Rancho Panole, maybe <laughs> won't be, <laughs> won't be on Ridge Trail or won't be on the Bay Area Ridge Trail. But I actually know the Bay Area Ridge Trail does go through Rancho Panole. Oh, no, so that's what I said, except. <laughs> hey, yeah. But I, I do think, I mean, connectivity is one thing I, I'm, I'm here to advocate for. But also, I think it's important for us to look at uh, and for the park district to look at future trends and what what people will want in the future if i know that a lot of the i guess I, I was a little bit upset with the way that the trail survey that the user survey was designed and that you know it only showed primary I'm, I'm sure that the park district has that data but it only shows what your top use is so every probably everybody hikes that also bikes and is equestrian but when i looked at the user survey equestrian wasn't wasn't on there you know, and I think that it would be interesting to understand. I do think that there, there is, of course, increased mountain bike usage. And I think that there's a lot of young people that are doing that and are looking for that opportunity. And if we took the stance of like, no mountain bike trail, no bikes now for any of the land bank um, properties, that that just means that no kids would get to bike, <laughs> would have a place to bike in the East Bay in the future. And so I think that it's really important that we kind of look at this conflict now and also look at the trends and just acknowledge acknowledge how use is going and, and what we can do now to curb and do responsibly manage that. Well, I think one of the things is you have to have assumptions, you have to protect uh, wildlife and the wildlife values and native habitat values. Because, for example, you talked about connectivity. One of the big issues that occurred when we worked on the EBMUD issue was the, the push to have uh, the Skyline Trail as a connector for certain rich trail connections. Well, Skyline is a very sensitive habitat area. And EBMUD just said, there's no way we're going to allow that. Because yeah. Of and that's great. And I guess in that case, then it, it's important that we come up with an alternate that's less environmentally sensitive that people can still connect so they don't poach the Skyline Trail and use that, you know, so I think, I think that that's important. But also, I, I don't know who, what your name is, because it says on your, um, on your, it says JTC, but I don't know if you had it a perspective too, if, if you wanted to. Yes, yes. My name is Gabriella. I am representing the youth. Um, and froze, froze. Gabriella, we lost your signal. Yeah, I have to I don't know, somehow sign off and come back in. I don't know how that's going to work. Or maybe, uh, maybe if you um, pause your video too. I pause the video. There you go. You're back. Yeah. Oh, hello. Hello. Yeah. They want to pause, put, pause the video, just be twice. <laughs> yeah, Gabrielle, turn off your camera because your bandwidth is low. Yeah. So we'll, we'll probably be able to hear you better if your camera is off. Okay, there you go. Excellent. Yeah, okay, so where did I leave off? 
You were representing you didn't youth. Start. <laughs> youth perspective. Oh yes. Oh my God. Sorry. There was an emergency helicopter. Mm. But you guys can go on. Okay. Um, well, maybe oh. I guess in norm, you know, maybe I, I, I might just add that um, I have faith in, I, I do believe that the, the park district staff and all of the trail staff, I mean, they are going through all of the regulatory processes, both state and federal, to be able to build these trails. I think that's part of the reason why it takes so long to get approval. So, so in, in my assumptions of like, yeah, I, I do believe that, and because like, I do believe that the park staff is, is going, is, is looking, taking these things into consideration and building new trails. I guess that was kind of the original question. Um, so. I don't know. I don't know that. I mean, just to sort of play devil's advocate here, I, th I think EBRPD versus Ed Mudd, for instance, is a really interesting just juxtaposition in as much as, yeah, the park district takes into account everything that you were, you were implying, Simone, but tends to put public recreation as first on the list, whatever that recreation might be. And for Ed Mudd, the first thing on the list tends to be refuge. Public recreation is always on the list, but it's very, it's very much lower and much less accommodated with respect to disruption of refuge property because their first priority is water quality and also control. They're just sort of control freaks over a lot of that as well. So, you know, institutional uh, uh, culture notwithstanding, um, I'm wondering whether with respect to management, and your, your request for alternative uh, uh, routes, if, 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 for instance, as a private land trust, we can close our property any day of the week. We can just throw the gate and say, sorry, you know, there is no shall in our, our ownership of the property. We can protect it as we see fit, although our first priority is to provide public recreation. But should we have to do that, we would. And I wonder if the park district might un undertake or contemplate the notion of sort of like with rangeland management, a rotational system where, um, you know, there's a certain load put on the property for a certain amount of time, and then it's closed. People don't simply presume that they have uh, recreational access forevermore in exactly the same way under all conditions. It's not a shall, it's a, for a while until we decide that, you know, we're going to manage it in a different way for, we let it rest as it were. Um, I, I don't know. I just throw that out there because I think pr there's this presumption once you have a trail, it's always going to be a trail. And, it, and once it's a trail, everybody should have the right to use it. And I don't, I don't, you know, it's a, it's a responsibility. It's sort of like driving again, you know, you don't have a right to drive. You, ever, you know, you're given the, the um, privilege to drive as you exercise it responsibly. And there are times when you close the road because it's, it's in need of repair, you know, 4 a.m., you want to cross the Bay Bridge, forget it. It's, you know, it's closed, alternate route. Could the, could the park district begin to contemplate that kind of strategy based on the notion that it is a limited resource? There is a point at which there's just there's not enough water, there's not enough land for all of the uh, pressure of uh, any kind of use. It needs to rest. That's a, that's a good point, Linus. Yeah. So we have- My thing I've also talked about is the carrying capacity, so to speak, and the impact of so many users on the parks, you know, and some parks that are close to the population areas the, the impact is going to be tremendous. You may, you may reach a point where it's just over capacity uh, for people of any, you know, hikers, bikers, I mean, you just, it's just over capacity. Right. And to that point, I mean, can you rotate a property out so that it begins to divert that, that load um, and, and then with the anticipation that it's brought back online so that you're, you know, you're rerouting people enough that it, it, it breaks up, breaks up that impact. I don't know. I'm just yeah, throwing it out there. It's, it's not easy. I think, Naomi, you want to say something? or? Oh, I was just going to kind of do a time check. We have about 
20 minutes. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you guys want to move on to the next, um, the next question. I think some of, some of these ideas as well are, are good and will probably also apply to the next question, which is. Um, Before we move on, I do, in terms of assumptions, I think uh, another, uh, somehow this is maybe a wrong, an assumption in the negative way, which is that from my experience, certainly in observation on trails is that there are many, when you're on a hiking trail, there are many places where there are clearly from bike trail marks and the steepness of the slope actually, clearly rogue bike trails that have been created. And I think that I have to say that I, I, I think the mountain bike community simply cannot ignore that issue, it, it, it occurs. And it, it's pretty shocking in certain, certain trails, just how many rogue little cutoffs and cutbacks and things like that have I, I, I've seen on the trails. Um, can, can I suggest um, something in this regard? You know, to deal with that. I, I don't, I, uh, you know, it's the, and I struggle with this because I, I think when we start talking about the mountain bike community or the, the, the hiking community or equestrians and so forth, the notion that the mountain bike community needs to take responsibility for rogue behavior by mountain bikers is to say that it is some sort of monolithic community. You know, I've got teenagers building teenagers. You know, the teenagers need to take responsibility for teenagers. There's kids out in the, in the woods that are not on mountain bikes building forts and swings and, and all sorts of disruptive things off trail um, that aren't representative of, of some community. They're just kind of offline individuals. So I, the, the solution orientation, I mean, I think everybody appreciates um, the wilderness values, the habitat values. Everybody wants that experience. I just, I don't think we, I understand the, the sort of the, the, adversarial strategy, but I don't think it advances us when we, when we start saying that the mountain bike community is, is monolithic and has to take responsibility for itself. I think mountain bikers frequently acknowledge that there are rogue trails and would, would easily agree with you that that's, that's, that's a, a, a bad actor and, and damages habitat and nobody wants to see that. I think we're all, we all need to take responsibility for people that are rogue actors and sh shut them down. I mean, but I don't think that means shut down mountain bikers. It means shut down uh, bad actors, just as you wouldn't want that person on the road, if it's on the freeway or whatever, somebody's going the wrong direction. I mean, you know, who's the highway patrol? Well, that gets to the enforcement issue. Right. But, and, and certainly it's not to say that this is a monolithic, uh, you know, mountain bike community is just that what I was trying to get at is that this this there seems to be my perspective and others more rogue trails when there are mountain bikers on a trail okay. and, and so, potentially greater damage because greater of the damage. nature of the of the mechanic we have to make that as an assumption and then figure out how we reach somehow some kind of solution to deal with it you know yeah. I mean, Brioni's is a good example of where there was all these rogue trails created. Uh, and now, I mean, now the mountain bike community wants to, certain mountain bikers, I'll put it that way, want to say, well, we'll just now convert those all to bike trails. Well, you know, now, now you've basically gone through a process where you've created an illegal trail and, uh, and now you get to convert it to a, a legal trail. Uh, so, I mean- and I do think that, I do think that is an enforcement issue. I mean, I, folks do oh. have to appreciate that, yeah. CEQA process doesn't doesn't anticipate just a, a road trail becoming available, you know, independent of a biological opinion and so forth. There has to be some sort of mm -hmm. sort of uh, enforcement, but that's true for for all use. I mean, we don't we don't just start allowing hikers to use social trails because then there's an animal trail and suddenly you've got you've got something in place that it's not supposed to be. I don't. God, I, I wish I'd never gotten involved with this group. It's it's really. It's too difficult a <laughs> dilemma. <laughs> well, I think this is I think this is moving on to kind of the next question. So I think we can go ahead and move on. Um, but what ideas do you have for promoting conservation goals and minimizing the impacts of trail use? So I mean, education. Like, yep. Yeah, so education um, enforcement is really important. Um, I, I do believe that I 
You know, I think it's, uh, I wish that we could get uh, the presentation from John Campo at Marin County Parks and his environmental roundtable and the work that they've done in the way that they approached new properties was by not identifying who will be using the trail whatsoever, but just starting with like, so not saying, oh, this will be a mountain bike, this will be an equestrian, but starting with the premise of let's build a trail in a location where it's going to impact the least amount of resources, it will make the most sense, et cetera. And starting from that framework, which I'm positive is 10 times more expensive, <laughs> you know, because it's not going to be existing ranch roads. Um, then moving from that and looking at how to build a sustainable trail after the fact when that you're not going to be worried about being on skyline ridge and impacting you know sensitive native habitats and so i think i mean i think that 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 is an excellent example that's already happening in the bay area that um seems like a great way to to frame things but also you know clearly it's expensive it's collaborative it takes a longer time but it seems like it's really working well for them and it's prevented a lot of lawsuits um uh, by environmental groups um so yeah i i think that's something we east bay should look at that sounds a good idea. Uh, it raises two questions. One is, or part of this, what what do we need to look for is that then the park district really needs to do the the baseline studies for the area to determine what is sensitive and native habitat, which is it goes back to the whole issue of what stewardship is doing, which is to uh, evaluate uh, the all, the entire park system in terms of of what native habitat and wildlife values it has and what needs to be protected. And that, that's, that, that's, that's something that I and others in the environmental community have always been saying is that the park district needs to first do that, those baseline studies initially. Often what they say is, well, we'll do that later. We'll kind of create a, a, an idea for a trail and then we'll look at it, but then we'll, we'll supposedly do those baseline studies later. Well, they need to do those up front. That's what I hear you say. Is that really true, Norman? I, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out, I mean, I'm not challenging you on that, but I mean, the notion of going into a CEQA process uh, as the park district is, 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 you know, they have, they're, sus they're susceptible to all of that without having really done the uh, habitat uh, resource area studies, the, the, all of the biological opinions, so forth. Uh, whichever order you go at it, you're still going to have to the, have those studies before you start cutting trails. So I, I'm, I, is it really true that you think they're establishing trails outside of the, of a regulatory process without knowing yeah. what the, what the habitat yeah, values yeah. are? That was one of the fundamental issues and criticisms of what was going on at Sibley with McCoster. Well, I, I guess I would just, promote the idea still and again it's very high level general probably not as effective as it might be but i don't think the public knows what a sequel process is i don't think they understand much of what goes into design and implementation of trail building and to simone's point if there is some way and i feel as the land trust that we have an obligation to inform the public about why we do the things we do and why the properties we preserve are important to pre preserve because they contribute to to their acquisition and they also want to visit them so the more information we can promote to say this is why this is important but also the park district has this wonderful bully pulpit and the capacity to educate the public in this is why we're purchasing this natural resource. It's not just for your bike trail, it's, you know, or for your or equestrian trail or whatever. It's because it's a natural resource. It's very important to us. And these are all the reasons why it's important. And the more you can get the public to understand why it is that they should cherish these places and that there's this design conceit that then evolves out of that based upon, you know, Norman's perspective on, yes, yeah, stewardship values up front, what, what are we dealing with? Um, people will, their, their, their appreciation deepens as to, you know, why everybody uh, wants to protect those habitat values, whether you're on a bike or horse or a pedestrian. I'm actually more concerned with everybody having that ethos than protecting one another's aesthetic experience when you're out in the park. 
I'm, I'm less concerned with people protecting one another's notion of what that experience should be as how, how is it that everybody carries the, the, the uh, concept of the park itself should be protected for its, its intrinsic values, however I'm behaving in it, uh, you know, whatever my medium. And that's a big educational lift, but I think the park district is beautifully positioned to be able to do that. And, and that's less on the enforcement side and more on the OG, you know, p you know people being enlightened. Uh -huh. It's going to take uh -huh. a while. Yeah. Um, so I think the other, the other component of what uh, Simone, you were saying is that then it starts to sound like going back to, well, we're going to design uh, all trails to be multi-use from the beginning. Is that what you're saying? Oh, absolutely not. Um, okay. What what I'm saying is, and I don't think that it seems from all the perspectives shared in the group that that doesn't make sense. Though I do work for and represent a multi-use trail that would love to connect through certain properties. We understand that, of course, it doesn't make sense in certain areas. Um, and, you know, that's why we advocate for just having alternate or parallel connection on the Ridge Trail. But um, I think that it's important that, you know, it does seem like it would be beneficial if there were a mount a is there a mountain bike only trail in the entire park district you know i wonder you know i mean i think that those are all things that we should be considering um and i i but i do think that it's also important to acknowledge that all all uh uses have their impacts um and I, I guess I will also say I'm, I'm a little bit floored at like at how few bike res bike resources there are compared to equestrian resources for the percentage of the population that's using them. Um, and I think that that's something that should be considered overall, um, personally, just in the in the in the parks that are the closest to population centers. Um, so I mean, that's a personal opinion, um, not that of the Ridge Trail, but but I, I was I was interested in learning that as well. I'm no, I'm no equestrian. <laughs> I mean, I, I think the- Me neither. <laughs> I'm a hiker. I don't want to go down a rabbit hole here or a horse hole, but I mean, I mean, the issue there is if a horse needs a stable and there's a lot of stuff that a horse needs that you, that a bike doesn't need <laughs> or a hiker doesn't need. So, I mean, that's the problem. The horses really need stables or a place to where they, if they bring in with their uh, trailers, a place to park the trailer. I mean, that becomes really, you're taking up two or three spaces when you bring in a horse, if you don't have it in a stable, so. Yeah, but I mean, I think, I, I don't think that anyone in this group, I don't think that anyone really has said all, all trails should be multi-use, but I guess that it's just terrible to acknowledge that only 12 miles of trails have been built. So if you can only build 12 miles in 20 years, then it makes sense that that's what the park district would pursue, something that would would be beneficial for all people. So I understand this like lack of re, you know lack of resources to be able wow. to make beautiful trails for each trail user group, you know, or ones that are good combos for this type or combos for this type. You know, I mean, there's resource limitations. Well, I, I I personally think that 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 probably needs to be done. That there needs to be a way to deal with the issue of the bike bikers want to be able to ride safely themselves and not and not have to deal with uh, uh, pedestrian or equestrian users that would affect their experience. You know, I mean, I've been on the trails. Many of the bikers are very polite. They they stop for you as they're supposed to because they're supposed to yield to hikers and horses. Uh, but then quite a number just and it's not because they're nasty, mean, or anything. It's just they're on the bike and they're, you know, they're going. And we're, it's easier for me as the hiker to step out of the way than for them to, to stop the bike. So, and I don't think they, they particularly would enjoy stopping their bike. So I think it, it you know, it, it, I think going back to Linus' view or ideas, user experience is something we need to look at. And, and that also means what's the user experience for, uh, for people on, on bikes who want to be able to have a biking experience that doesn't have hikers and equestrians interfering with it. So are you, are you suggesting sort of a skate park strategy, as it were? You know, you just segment that population. I mean, I'm not against that. I just, well, uh, 
you sacrifice there, some property as it were to that may be a way to go because i mean you know skate in in a certain sense skateboarding was is is somewhat analogous at the very beginning skateboarders yeah. were everywhere people were going either coming down the you know barreling down the sidewalk at me uh that kind of thing we got to put them somewhere where they can do their thing of course skateboarding is very different from from most mountain bikers uh but yeah. But the the obsessive dedication to it is not dissimilar. It's like I'm going to I'm going to use my skateboard, um, and I think I think uh, municipalities, you know, accommodated that in ways that you know, kind of hardscape. You know, we're going to cut out some carve out some land and and make it work. Right, and you know, and and you can see that in uh, again, this is this this is a there's a. a you know, it's not a monolithic group, as you say, Linus. <clears throat> but the the one one of the videos I put up in my presentation, the, the third one, this is a place called Sky Park in southern either Southern California or Southern Nevada. I mean, hmm. you got to take a look at it. I mean, it's pretty amazing, and it's clearly a a bike only, a mountain bike only park. Okay, is it for profit? I I I don't I it may be it's, it's a privately owned area yeah so i keep looking i go man this is this is a business opportunity for somebody <laughs> so you know? oh we're supposed to leave i think we're up we're up on time here yeah. oh no. we're wrapping up okay uh so i'm trying to get here we, we talked about the idea of uh that uh the, the, the parks and, and trails may be a limited resource that um, maybe we need caps um, to accommodate that limited resource. There's issues about how to deal with connectivity and um, uh, addressing future trends, uh, protecting wildlife and habitat values, maybe a rotational system for parks, uh, people taking responsibility for trails is one way of dealing with how to, how to deal with the rogue trail issue and with enforcement and education. Um, and what else? I want to make sure I'm more passing. jobs. I, more I jobs. Monitor. If I get anything wrong, just you know, shout out. So that's I thought. I think that was a good surmise. Yeah. Hi, Rick. Hi, Helen. I will start recording our breakout group. Hi, Kim. Hi, hi, Kim. Hi there. We only have two people in our group. <laughs> it's me and Helen. <laughs> um, more people may shot. be coming in. I oh. see Joseph. All right, I will start sharing my screen. Uh, just to let you know, I'll just be an observer and note taker. Can I have one of you volunteer to be the, um, to bring our discussion back to the larger group? Who's um, gonna leap in? <laughs> uh, I'll, 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 if nobody, I mean, I'll just do it if nobody else wants to do it. If somebody else would like to do it, please step up to the plate. I was gonna recommend you, Helen. So oh. we think alike. <laughs> <laughs> and Helen, I'll have our uh, screen shared up so you'll have the notes when we uh, go back to the larger group. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Kim. Yep. Let me know if you can see the screen. It has the two questions and we are in breakout group number five. Super. There you go. And Kim, what time, what, it's at 11 now. So we done at 11.30, 11.35. Yeah, I think you said 35 minutes, so. Yeah, and I think Amanda will, will send um, some time updates such as like moving on to question two, five more minutes. So I'll, I'll be timekeeper as well if she sends those messages. Awesome, thank you. Well, I'll, I'll, um, I'll put my big toe in the water on number one and say what assumption. I think clearly one assumption is that there are multiple viewpoints about um, that need to be considered in developing new trails. That one interest um, shouldn't dominate. Uh, my assumption. Go ahead. 
I was going to just say my assumption is <clears throat> that there will be competing interest because we have limited resources and resources here could be trails, could be time of day, could be day of week, could be time of year. And when anytime you have competing interests, we really need to have an emphasized communication and planning in order to try to accommodate the multiple interest for the limited resources. I think what I was going to say is sort of a corollary to Joseph's, which is you can't design every trail for every user. Um, could there, so I, I think also an assumption could be we could create a portfolio of trails where some are designated multi-use and be more specific about those multi-uses and others could be designated as single use. Mm -hmm. and, and if we're clever as to how, in terms of proximity and use of, use of the trail by day or, or time of day, we may be able to accommodate most of the users and also plan for the future. Um, I just like to say um, that I, I like what um, Jim Hansen was saying in his last in the last presentation about starting off with, you know, a big map of the district and looking at the areas that are, you know, where there's critical habitat or some kind of restriction. So in other words, start off with looking at the land what's a, so that you get a sense of what trails appropriate for what land. I, Helen, I'm going to put that in number two. It sounds like an idea on how to address the, does that make more sense or should I put that in number one? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, no, number two, I think you're right. Um, okay. Start Can with looking at the land and oops. sensitive areas. Okay. I would say my portfolio is more of an idea than an assumption as well, Kim. So it can go in number two. I think we've moved on to number two and that's probably appropriate. Um, I, Joseph mentioned communication earlier. And I know that when we were dealing in the uh, Park Advisory Committee with, uh, with dog issues, uh, education and communication was a very important part of it. Uh, because we have so many different users, it makes sense to come up with ways to, for instance, have mountain bikers work with other mountain bikers to communicate to them the, the rules of the road. Uh, and that's that could be true for any user group. And I probably said too much, but I'm sure Kim can edit that for me. <laughs> uh, the other idea I would have is if um, I'm going to advocate for more enforcement, and I know that means more money, but if there's no cop on the beat, uh, I don't know how you get people to adhere to rules. Um, right. Some people, right? It could be a, it could be just one percent of the population that misbehaves, and that that would just you know be right. enough. Well, Joseph, I agree with you on that one. Um, the question is, where are you going to get the money from? That's what the park district is going to say. That it's so expensive yeah. to have enforcement, and so what are what would be cost effective ways to um, get enforcement? Yeah, and I and I agree, but I would like to think maybe there's a we can lean on technology in some ways. Maybe um, we tap into the philanthropic community in the Bay Area, um, the uh, 
community foundations, the other foundation, there's 75,000 foundations in the country. I know Hewlett is a big supporter of ours. They, they're, they're environmental foundations that could potentially um, step in here if we came to them with a plan. And, and as a pilot, right? We wanna increase enforcement in these areas over these many years. Um, the goal would be to hopefully mitigate um, negative behavior or impact on the environment. So I think there's a, there's a, it's an idea and it could get shot down, but it is an idea. Okay, I support the idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like, yes, that's right. I, uh, on that one, and I would say, especially sensitive areas, environmentally sensitive areas. Yeah. Right, I would add that. Well, what about, um, you know, cause I've been out hiking on the park district lands to the extent I can. And there are a lot of trails, like at, one is in Tilden um, that look like they've been created by um, <clears throat> off-road bikes that are coming down the hill and they're creating, um, you know, these so-called rogue trails. And my, and I'm thinking that that might be they might be doing that. I didn't see a lot of those trails being used. And this is Pleasanton Ridge I'm talking about right now. But I'm thinking that possibly those trails are used at night. And you know, like how do you deal with stuff like that? I mean, you know, night riding in parks and things like that um, from an enforcement from education, how, whatever area you want to come at this from, but how do you deal with it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the, that could be the 1% I'm talking about that are going to do what they're going to do. And unless you have night vision cameras up somewhere that are capturing them, and then all you have is a, a, a video or picture evidence that somebody's doing it since bikes don't have license plates, right? Yeah. You can't track it that way. But if if the video cameras show a repeated pattern, then we could bring enforcement to that area um, at those times to then cap, catch the, the people doing it. Um, but that's, you know, dangerous work and I'm not signing up for it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then what about, I mean, in the past, there, there's been talk of having um, mountain biker patrols, you know, volunteer patrols out looking for scoff laws, basically. But is that, um, I don't know if that, I don't know if that would work or not. What do you, or is yeah. there, is there a, a volunteer patrol now. I think there might be actually. Yeah, I think that the uh, uh, the Bicycle Trails Council uh, does that. I know they in Joaquin Miller Park they are they do work in the park, and I think they also do some patrolling. But that's certainly that's in line with the I, the suggestion I made that uh, use the user groups should patrol them themselves to an extent, and I think that's uh, certainly a. a a more effective and efficient way of, of enforcement than having to expand the uh, safety department to the extent that you need to cover all these areas. So yes, uh, I would strongly encourage working with groups like the Bicycle Trails Council and ask them to send volunteers out on the weekend or on that evening or whatever to uh, talk with people. Rick, Helen, uh, what do you think about um, just general park signage? Do we do we have an adequate amount of signage? I I agree with you there. I think there needs to be more. Um, uh, although signage only goes so far. I mean, because like you see at um, 
Briones at the, I think, what was it, the Alhambra Creek entrance. Um, there were several rogue trails right near the beginning of the hiking trail. And there was a little sign, you know, I think it was a red van, you know, no bikes. And then yet um, there were all these, you know, there were, it was clearly a, a heavily used area. So I don't know. I mean, I think signage has its limitation, but I do agree that there should be more. And then the other thing is maps, you know, information on maps. I think clearly that's... Um, well, the, the, other, the other benefit signage has is it leads to enforcement, right? Because if, if, if someone is clearly um, aware that they shouldn't be doing something because of a sign, then it's, it's easier to enforce. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to, right. to go to a, 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 a person, a scoffler, as you say, who um, doesn't even know they're breaking the law or rule because they didn't see any sign. Right. I, I think that's a good point that um, more signs makes it easier to, I totally support that. You can also use the signage to educate people, yeah. uh, make the point, not just, you know, no, don't go on this trail, but some maybe a comment about endangered species or some mm -hmm. other, whatever the reason is that you're not allowed that, so that you're educating them as well as just saying no. Love that, love that. Now I noticed that a Sean Burke has joined us and- Yes. Yes, now I, what group are you with? Uh, I'm the land program director for Save Mount Diablo. Oh, okay, okay, great. Well, can we see you and not your beautiful bird there or is that? <laughs> I'm sorry, my service is kind of in and out. Um, I'm on the side of the road. I'm dealing with my van oh, being towed oh, okay. right now. Got but it. Got it. Okay. but uh, Got it. As, as far as signage is concerned, um, I was a park ranger for a number of years, and you'd be surprised how many people walk right by signs that say one thing or the other. But the reality of signage is, is that it allows um, for park enforcement. If there is no signage stating one use or the other, especially in the East Regional Park yeah. District within Ordinance 38, there has to be a signage in order for there to be enforcement for one thing or the other, um, yeah. or else they don't have a bounds to enforce. Yeah. But also, um, you know, educational signage is really important, just in general and of itself, specifically for all user groups. Um, you know, the more educated we all can become the more we understand all of these different nuances within utilizing these trails and management of them. Yep. Great. Sean, uh, we did go over number one, but if you have um, any responses to that, feel free and I'll take down the notes. The first question was, what assumptions do you think are important for the district to consider in developing new trails? Assumptions. Um, hmm. I, I just think that, I don't know if it's an assumption or not, but it's important for people to become educated and it's something that can't happen overnight. It takes a long time for people to spend time in these places and understand even a fraction of the nuances of them, to be honest. I mean, I was a ranger for 10 years and I've been doing, you know, conservation-based work for 15 or 20 years, and uh, I continuously learn things on a daily basis. So the reality of it is, is that it's, I guess, an assumption could be that this is a lifetime learning experience that we have, that we all have to be um, conscientious of each other's opinions and outlooks, and then also how to utilize those different nuances uh, in the management of these areas uh, responsibly. Okay, I tried to capture everything you said, but I may have missed some things. Oops. Uh, it, looks, it looks fairly good. I mean, I guess, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if the park district really can assume anything other than, you know, people want to have a good time in these places. <clears throat> and um, I think the best thing for the land is for people to become educated. 
to all these different nuances. And, you know, I, I say this to people all the time. I feel like it's almost should be a responsibility of, of all of us as citizens to be a park ranger for a couple of years, just to understand all, <laughs> how, how diverse this game really is, you know? So I don't think that's going to become a constitutional right Not or, or COVID, focus. <laughs> right. But I feel like it's just, it's, it's a multi-edged sword. And so the more we can work together, the more important and that is, and the better I think our connection as a society will be to these places and therefore the management, uh, you know, will follow that as well as the respect. And that, that's an excellent point, Sean. And I'm gonna add that to one of the ideas, but one of the assumptions since Kim, you're there, I said, we should assume that there's going to be more people using parks. Yes, I just yeah. had the same thought, yeah. Um, and, and, right. and, and anytime you get newbies, you have <laughs> a learning curve, right? <laughs> right. So not only you're going to get more volume, but you're going to have a greater need for education of, of uh, trail etiquette. Yes. Right. And then with regard to the idea uh, that Sean sparked for me is we should actually have a, a YouTube channel where we have park rangers getting interviewed or testimonials or storytelling. So park ranger stories on YouTube. <laughs> that would be that would be great. That I can see that going one of multi ways. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great, um, an, another thing about, uh, and I totally support is that <clears throat> there will be in continued increased use. And that means that we're gonna, the park district is going to need a way to fund um, further development of trails and land bank areas and so forth, given the risk, I mean, understanding there are restrictions and, um, I know the park district is starting to think about a possible um, continuation of the parcel tax. And so I think we need to, we need to, I mean, I think an, an assumption is that all this act, this trail stuff is gonna need require additional funding. Yep. And um, I guess I'll leave it there. I guess another one, and this is kind of tongue in cheek, but these park districts should assume to expect the unexpected <laughs> because all of these things do. I mean, then we get kind of slammed with weather events like 2017, we had trails disappear for flooding and things like that. So natural disasters are a thing that come into play too. And the thing is, is that these are wild places and more and more people utilize them. So there's a room for conversation. Yes. Oh. Boy, that's a big one. Yeah. I just uh, talked to a colleague of mine who lives near Yosemite and, and he said um, during the, the smoke was so bad during the fires that he wound up buying an RV to drive out of the area because he couldn't find hotels or anywhere else to go that wasn't impacted by the smoke. So his family, and he's married with a young child now, he bought an RV because of what Sean just alluded to. And if, if the fire season extends uh, as it continues or, or is as intense as it has been, um, behavior like that is gonna be more widespread. Yeah. Maybe more widespread. Yeah, certainly. Um, is there an assumption that we are actually maintaining the parks properly? Um, I had a call yesterday and with the um, National Forest Foundation and they were talking about Big Jack East Forest Project near Truckee. 
and uh, they were talking about how they're using, um, they're culling, they're cutting some of the trees, which I know is, is hard for a lot of people to stomach. Um, but because in that particular part, there hadn't been enough uh, natural fires to, to, to keep the forest balanced. Uh, and then, uh, you know, insects, and then of course, um, uh, so I don't know if we're, if we have a policy and that we're adhering to the policy for adequate park maintenance to, to mitigate some of the damage from fires. So Sean, maybe you can address that. Well, I can, I can probably address it okay. from the point of view of the park district, which is that uh, there's never enough money for all the work they need to do. And I know right now they're being really severely challenged by the, uh, the tree die off. Uh, okay. They, they've estimated they need, I think the number is $40 million to remove the trees that have died. And so wow. having to get federal uh, funding and other sources for that. So yeah, they, they don't have a, adequate funds and it's gonna be challenging in the current environment. Right, that's, that's definitely, definitely a reality. And I, I think one thing to try to hold on to is just any management that is done in these areas or with the best intent, uh, with the science-based background, you know, there will be any number of specialists that will come in and make recommendations, and that will be the recommendation for the management of these areas with these management plans going on. So I think that that's one of the things you have to kind of just hold on to and make that assumption that the management of these areas is with best intentions um, for the natural environment, you know. But the, but the tree die-off that was just mentioned, these are huge projects. It, we have a large die off in the state park we're working with right now. You know, thousands of trees have died overnight. And so now we're in the process of working with consultants to try to understand what is going on so that once we know what is going on, all the different nuances involved with that, now we can start discussing management plans and things like that. You know, climate change is a big unknown, you know, the unexpected. Yep. But it sure one, makes for exciting dynamics. <laughs> um, yeah, just to kind of end on a, or as we end, uh, just put a positive spin on it. Um, other meetings I've been a part of in the Midwest, they were looking at park, at, at foliage, at trees, at, at um, what they could plant there that actually may offer greater health and wellness benefits. Um, they envisioned a future where um, if you were a cancer sufferer, you can go into this part of the forest and get benefits. If you had suffered from um, allergies or some other ailment, uh, these plants, if you surround, if you forest bathe in those for two hours, uh, three times a week, would actually aid in your healing. We know that some doctors are prescribing forest walking or, or nature walks along with uh, medication these days. So, uh, I, I think we can start to reframe how people think about parks and how they could also be viewed as having tremendous pharmaceutical benefit, right, or, or uh, healing benefits. That's an uplifting finish. Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> I think I will go ahead and put that under ideas. So okay. reframe how we, can you repeat that view? How we, yeah, how we view parks and maybe think of them as um, part of the, well, well so they have pharmaceutical benefits, health and wellness benefits. Um, doctors are prescribing nature walks now along with medications, things like that. And, and the, the bigger picture was are there ways to think about what we can plant or what, what science has uncovered about inhaling highly oxygenated air or some being next to certain trees or bushes that throw off additional medicinal benefits. And, and one, this one group was envisioning a time where if you were, if you were already suffering from cancer or, or something uh, like allergies, if you went in this area and stayed there for three hours, that would actually aid in your healing. So using the nate, using the park as actually um, um, a healthcare facility. I think that's a really good point to make. You know, especially 
thinking about that these places weren't always parks you know these places were home to a lot of people for a long 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 time and they you know that's exactly what they were for so many people you know once you can connect back into these places and you realize that you are a part of these places they're you're not just recreating necessarily then that's when we can start healing as an earth form you know and so that's that's a really interesting topic in and of itself that I'll kind of keep my cards close to that one because I can go down the line with that. But I think that's a really important topic to, to bring up. And Sean's going to volunteer to lead the uh, Ranger stories on YouTube. There you go. <laughs> uh, oh man, that, that that would be fun for about two of them. Then I'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> oh, Sean, Sean, I have a meeting with Google uh, on Friday. Do you want me to bring this up with them? That we're interested. I mean, if if you, you don't have to actually be the talent, but if you know other people who would do this, we can get it started this Friday. You know, Shelton Johnson and Yosemite National Park. Yep. That guy is, he's incredible, you know, and uh, <laughs> he's been a mentor, a hero of mine for years. And mm -hmm. that's what he did essentially with the Ken Burns yes. documentary. And that's what he continues to do in Yosemite. So, I mean, mm -hmm. he's in, he's in the, you know, the most loved place on earth. So I, well, you know, if I can make a recommendation, he's, he's the person for sure. He's incredible. Well, the park district also has Doug McConnell who does a lot of uh, this is true yeah yeah so no well i would like to copy what sheldon's doing not ask sheldon to do it for <laughs> these the regional folks so let's let's harness our own talent locally and just recreate it this has anyone good. seen the uh, park naturalists in their videos i think they've put them up on our uh, park district website on facebook and I think they may be on YouTube. I don't think there's a channel for it though. <laughs> yeah, there's some great ones. Um, Francis uh, Mendoza did a lot of great presentations. He's a good friend of mine. He actually did some presentations for us with uh, Kevin Dixon. He's another great naturalist. They're all real talented, you know? So any, any of those individuals would be great representatives. Sergio yep. Huerta would be another great person to reach out to. He's been a firefighter for 30 some odd years and a park ranger slash supervisor. He's He's a total wizard too. And he has the soft skills to be a good presenter in a diplomatic form. <laughs> yeah. that, that could be a new career for Francis he, as he moves on. He could, this is uh, true. He's, yeah. he, Francis is an incredible individual, great speaker, very inspiring. Yeah, he's, he's very good. Another, he's another good one, Morgan Gunther does some good stuff as well in, down at Crown Beach. Nice. Right. I think we have about three more minutes um, and we've got some good responses for both questions. Um, Helen, since you will be reporting back, um, would it help if we go over them again and highlight any or would you wanna go over all of them when we go back to the larger group? Uh, I think we should, let's see. I think we should pretty much try to cover, I think you can cover it pretty quickly. So. I would like to include everything that we came up with. Okay. And let me know if you need it to be zoomed in. Yeah. I can try and do that too. Slightly larger type would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can increase the size. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So we, we have, um, um, Kim, are there three different things, that, groups? Is it going to be one, the assumptions question, and then let's see, what were they now? Let's see the, the assumptions, and then that's one. And then two is, I, oh, ideas for promoting. Oh, OK, great, great. I see it. It all boils down to the two things. OK. And we've got uh, five breakout groups. We're breakout group number five. Okay. We'll be last but not least. 
but you'll have less to say then. You can just say, oh, you guys That's all right. covered that. That's <laughs> right. We, I refer to the previous comments. <laughs> Tim, you did record our session, so uh, anyone who wants yeah, to hear both, this, oh, right. this, About this the rich, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Joseph, I wanted to know, I your little thing says Joseph Muzan, COO, comma, outdoor Afro. And yes. what's best, what's, what does COO stand for? Oh, Chief Operating Officer. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we're closing in 50 seconds. So it was, it's been nice, you guys. Uh, okay, good. See you, back, sure. in big, See you back, back in the big room. See you back in the room. Right. Thank Thanks, you. Kim. Thanks. Great talking with everyone. Thank you. See so you, Sean.